Association with uh, cooperation with Doctoral Government and Polish Dental Students Association. It is a great honor and a pleasure to greet you uh, on International Medical Congress of Silesia 2022. Uh, first of all, we thank very much authorities of our university for coming. We greet all present part we thank very much members of scientific committees for coming and spending time with us. Uh, we greet all present participants. It is a great pleasure for us that we are receiving abstracts on such a high scientific level from so many scientific societies from many universities from Poland and abroad. It is uh, it we, it's, thanks you uh, for your work and determination uh, that we can be holding the title of one of the biggest medical students conference in Poland. It is no doubt that we students with support of our tutors create science. Mm, we also thank uh, our patrons and sponsors uh, Rector of our uni Medical University of Silesia, Polish Minister of Health, a Polish, Polish Minister of Education and Science, Marshal of Silesian Voivodeship, the Mayor of Katowice, and the Chairman of Board of Metropolis uh, GZM. Uh, we thank our media patronage uh, for Dietetyce Org and Polish Television in Katowice and our sponsors, Duda Ingves Clinic, Edra Urban and Partner, Implantologia Stomatologiczna, Lepolek, Sarstedt, Reshape, Medycyna Praktyczna, Uniformix, PZWL, Więcej niż Lek, Medfarm Polska, Kalmar Pro, Akademia Młodych Uczonych PAN, Klub 30 Polskiego Towarzystwa Kardiologicznego, Polskie Towarzystwo Implantologiczne, Klub Młodych Nefrologów Polskiego Towarzystwa Nefrologicznego, Polskie Towarzystwo Dietetyki, Ogólnopolskie Studenckie Towarzystwo Ortopedyczne, Towarzystwo Chirurgów, Polskie Towarzystwo Nadciśnienia Tętniczego, Polskie Towarzystwo Diagnostów Laboratoryjnych. This year, slogan of our Congress is into the unknown, because we are entering the world after pandemic where everything will change and how it will look like it will really depend on us. We are meeting new challenges and gathering new opportunities and experience. We are evolving, we are improving. Right now, please take the floor, Vice-Rector for Scientific Affairs and International Collaboration, Professor Mijastec, Katarzyna Mijastec. Thank you. Dear professors, dear students, dear all guests, um, on behalf of Rector of Medical University of Silesia, Professor Tomasz Szczepański, I cordially welcome on the International Medical Congress of Silesia, the biggest scientific students congress in Poland. I'm really happy to see so many young scientists. I'm delighted to meet with you. Uh, I'm sure that your scientific development is an integral, integral part of your studies and in studies in our university. Don't be aware about the conference. I'm sure that you are really well prepared. I'm sure that you have done your best to prepare excellent presentation, to prepare excellent papers. Uh, you all are winners. As I always explain to my students, awards, distinctions are important, but they are are, they are, of course, other important things of this conference. It means fun, challenge, success, of course, and meeting, friend, uh, meeting friends, meeting uh, other students, and meeting with your professors. And what else? Uh, I think that SIMC was and SIMC is a marvelous conference with great active participants and 
extra organizers. Thank you for organizing to all organizing committee. And what else? My dearest, I wish the SIMC will be a great event and a great success of our university. Carpe diem for the next three days. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now please take the floor the Curator of Student Scientific Association, uh, Professor Michał Holecki. Dear colleagues, dear friends, it's a great honor and pleasure to be with you today and to welcome you personally in uh, Katowice. It's a great opportunity for you to uh, exchange your scientific knowledge and uh, compete in the scientific field. In fact, it doesn't matter if you win or not, treat it like a great adventure. Uh, I do believe that you will find it very helpful, joyful. Uh, you are young doctors and or doctors to be, and you should remember that the doctor's task is to heal the patient, and it doesn't matter which way they do that. As Pablo Picasso said, if there were only one truth, uh, it, wouldn't, it won't be possible to paint 100 pictures at the same topic. Have a great fun in Katowice. Thank you very much. And now, we would like to invite uh, Dr. Habilitowany Adrian Smendowski. Uh, for performing a honorary lecture, uh, I Mysteries in the 21st Century, Futurology Becomes Reality. Okay, thank you very much. And in the beginning, I would like to really uh, thank to all the students association for this really honorable invitation to give the opening lecture for you, especially that not so long time ago, I was in the other side in the audience and listening the lectures and competing with other students and uh, being active in the association. Uh, which I started, in fact, uh, from my second year of medical study. It was some years ago, it was 2005. So uh, it's really, I feel uh, very touched that I can g show you some of my uh, recent achievements, recent work, and I hope you will find it interested. So I decided to uh, talk briefly about uh, about the eye obviously I'm I researcher I'm ophthalmologist so uh, not surprisingly that I choose some um, let's say the top uh, findings uh, related to the eye in the 21st century here on this first slide you can see the latest technology of eye imaging of in vivo eye imaging in clinical practice, which is called optical coherent tomography. And you can see that in living patient, you can do imaging of the whole structure of the eyeball, of the anterior segment, of the retina, of the optic nerve. And I will just relate to this a little bit later. So the eye is called small world. In fact, it's very complex, very sophisticated organ that uh, co its complexity, its um, kind of um, proof of perfection of the nature. I just listed here some of the most uh, incredible facts about the eyeball. For example, cornea is the most innervated tissue in human body. It contains over 7,000 of free epithelial nerve endings per one square millimeter. You can imagine how huge amount is that. 
The muscles that move your eyes are the fastest and the strongest muscles in your body. Of course, if you relate it to the function and the size. After the brain, your eyes are the, most, the second most complex organ in your body. Your eyes processing 24 million images in your lifetime. And they are responsible for about 85% of your total knowledge. So you can imagine now what kind of disaster are experiencing people that lost their vision, that are blind. Your eye can detect over 10 millions of the color hues. And also, the human optic nerve is one of the most densely packed nerves in uh, our body. It contains up to 2 million nerve fibers, and the diameter of the optic nerve is about 3 millimeters. So you can imagine how densely packed this structure is. The eye, on the other hand, is one of the poorest known organ in our body because of its complexity. And this translates into the fact that the most of serious eye diseases are untreatable and the most successful approach is based on early stage prevention like age-related macular degeneration or glaucoma. Because of that, uh, ophthalmologists are uh, kind of placed in the memes that we are solving problems you don't know you have in the ways you can't understand even. So this is true because in the beginning stage most of eye diseases, the fatal eye diseases are unnoticeable by patients and we are asking them to treat something that they even don't know they have. On the other hand Eye structures are really beautiful when you do science. You can see, for example, here, fluorescent staining of the retina with all the layers, all the cells. They are really pretty. This is something which made me really fascinated with this part of the, of the science when I first time saw the retinal images after immunostainings. And more examples of the retina. Look how pretty it is. These are glial cells, astrocytes, which are located in the retina exclusively. And you can see how pretty they look like. They create some branches, like you can uh, try to imagine that there is some river or something. So uh, this is just as a distractor, and we process further. So the most important part of the eye is retina, is a neuronal part. So it contains neurons. And as you remember from the histology classes, uh, there are several layers in the retina. I will not talk about all of them. But I just wanted to make uh, you to realize that, in fact, the retina or the eye is only a detector. It's like camera. And it transduces the signal from the eyeball from the retina, from the neuronal cells via optic nerve to the brain. And the centers of vision are in the back of the brain, in occipital cortex. So in fact, when we look, we see with brain, not with the eyes. Eyes are only detectors. Each retina contains photoreceptors, which is also a huge number. Each retina has approximately 1 million of rods and 3 million of cones and almost 2 million of ganglion cells. The ganglion cells are these important cells that are projecting from the retina to the brain. They are one of the longest neurons in our body. And moving to the clue of the, uh, this uh, short lecture, uh, of course, we remember from histology how the eye is structured. We know all the parts, we know uh, what is in the front, we know what is in the back of the eye. But also, the research regarding the eye is very intense in the last years. There are still some gaps that they are not filled. And this is the place for eye researchers. And in 21st centuries, there are several of big in this field, uh, big discoveries. 
regarding the cornea, the optic nerve, and the retinal structure. And in the end, I would like also to talk very briefly about something which is completely new in the uh, medical fields, uh, not only in ophthalmology, uh, it's also now very actively, very intensively developing in cardiology, for example, meaning gene therapies, which is like few years back, it was total futurology, now it's happening in the clinics. So gene therapies and also something which uh, very uh, often uh, is very exciting for the audience, bionic eye. I have a lot of patients that lost their vision and they are asking about some prosthesis of the eye. So we have it now, the bionic eye, and I will show you in the end of my lecture. So about cornea, there are two discoveries about the corneal structure. So um, there are two like new layers discovered in the cornea. And in one of this discovery, I had my input as well, and I will show you uh, how it looks. So from histology, you remember that cornea is built its form of five different layers. And this is kind of uh, standard knowledge. But in uh, 2012, there was discovery saying that there is one more layer located in the posterior part of the cornea, right in the posterior stroma. And this layer was very well characterized in electron mis microscopy. So uh, you can see it here on this, uh, on this one. So DL is this a new layer which is kind of very nicely formed and it's very nicely separated from other neighboring layers. Of course, for uh, like random situations, it may be not very important. It's called cornea having five or six layers, who cares, right? So, but for the whole input in scientific knowledge, in scientific world, it's very important to know the details because this might be very useful for, for example, corneal surgeons during corneal transplants the presence of this layer is extremely important because identifying of this layer in the grafts, in the corneal grafts, enables surgeon to separate the uh, corneal endothelium from the rest part of the cornea during endothelial transplants. So this is something which we are using in practice. The second layer, which was identified, in fact, this year in the, in the cornea, which is called pre-endothelial layer, is very mm, unique and untypical layer, which is located in the peripheral part of the cornea. It's between the decimate membranes and endothelium, and it's only in the periphery. This layer is very important from other reason. For, uh, for uh, maybe not only the structure, because it can be seen uh, as a kind of distinguished uh, layer between the decimate membrane and the endothelium. But it's very, it's very important for the fact that in this layer, there are special type of cells located, which are type of stem cells. So PET cells, which are progenitors for endothelium and trabecular meshwork. Both of the structures are not regenerating over during our uh, life. So corneal endothelium and corneal and uh, sorry trabecular meshwork, they are not regenerating. Meaning that if there is any damage to the structures, they are lost. They cannot be restored. So finding the stem cells that can differentiate into these types of cells is really crucial. These cells are having uh, typical stem cells features when they are um, obtained, when they are isolated from the cornea and plates and cultured in vitro, they form so-called spheres. The spheres are a very typical feature of the stem cells. Moving to the optic nerve, and here is my kind of flag uh, research, which I did some years ago together with my team. 
uh, we discovered that optic nerve contains in the um, proximal part, so in so-called optic nerve head, so the part of optic nerve that leaves, directly leaves the eyeball, it contains special types of synapses which were not seen there before, and this synapses uh, became a novel target for treatment of optic neuropathies. This um, synapses represent so-called electrical synapses. The electrical synapses are sy synchronizing neuronal webs. They are participating in neuroprotection and apoptosis processes. They provide interneuronal crosstalk. And in this case, in the uh, optic nerve, they are structured of connexin 36 and 45. So two proteins that are very um, specific for this uh, type of synapses. And on this example, I would like to show you how you can prove that there are some structures located, some protein structures located in certain tissue. So as we know, the protein expression, the gene expression pathways are very uh, well described, well known. They contain of certain steps. And in fact, in each of the steps, you can detect products or um, substances or uh, molecules that are related to this process. So if we are talking about connexin 36 and 45, you can detect in your samples using PCR the transcript, so the uh, mRNA. You can detect the protein itself, for example, using Western blots. You can uh, check the structure of this protein and location using immunofluorescence staining. You can check ultrastructure using electron microscopy. And finally, you can check the function. In this way, in this uh, um, case, uh, for example, visual evoked potentials. And uh, for this uh, proteins, uh, indeed, uh, they were detectable. Uh, as well as form of the uh, transcript. So you can see here the transcript of connexin 36, 45 detected in retina, in optic nerves, and also as a protein itself. So in Western blots, you can see that there are signal from connexin 36 and 45. But of course, the presence of the protein, it doesn't mean that there are real structures form of this protein. And also it doesn't mean that these structures are functional. So to see the location, you can run complex immunofluorescence stainings. And here I just want to show you examples. You can stain a specific axonal proteins, for example, beta-3 tubulin for the optic nerve axons. You can set the method that, for example, this axon will be seen in green or it will be seen in red. And then you can do the double staining using another markers with opposite color. So for example, red for synapses or green. And indeed in the samples it looks like this. So you can see the green accent or the red accent and the red synapses or green synapses along these axons. And here you have more examples how it looks. The ultrastructure requires employment of the electron microscopy. So you can see uh, very small details with very high mag, and you can see how this synapses actually look between two axons. So these are very typical shape uh, of the, of the uh, electric synapses. I made some scheme here that you can compare. So these are like double uh, uh, lines in just in opposite each other so you can see it here one next to another and here even with higher magnification so you can see very nicely the synapses are located there the next part you can use a method called immunolabeling so you will take some gold particles that are modified and can attach to certain protein in this case 
attached to the Connexin 45, and you can see very nicely that indeed this is Connexin 45 structure. So another confirmation. You can see that the scale is very tiny, it's 120 nanometers. So in this research which I just showed you, uh, which was mostly done in this university, uh, which I also would like to highlight, uh, we discovered synapses in the optic nerve that were before never seen, never described, never known. And uh, there are three types of these synapses. The most important are so-called GP1, so gap junctions 1, between two neighboring axons. And here I wanted to show you uh, some uh, mm, complex structure of the optic nerve where you have astrocytes, we saw them already before in retinal stainings, we have axons and we have all these GP, so gap junctions between different structures of the optic nerve. Here is just the more examples. So based on these res uh, results, we formed kind of new model of the structure of the optic nerve, which uh, is kind of um, structure with the cross connections between parallelly running axons. And these axons, where they are coupled by electrical synapses, are creating a kind of sensitium, which allows for longwise and also crosswise transduction of the signal. Because of these connections, the resistance of whole system of optic nerve is reduced. So the transduction of signal is faster. And this is very important from the point of view of optic neuropathies, because the visual field defects which we observe in certain diseases, they develop due to high resistance of the tr signal transduction in the optic nerve. And this also can be checked by blocking the synapses with some uh, chemical agents, for example, meclofenamic acid, which can prove that blocking of gap junctions is increasing the resistance and slowing down transduction in the optic nerve. And here are also some functional studies which have been done for that. Moving forward to the retina now. In the retina, the new discoveries which took place in 21st centuries are melanopsin retinal ganglion cells, discovered in 2002. As you know from uh, not only histology, but also from physiology, and maybe you remember from ophthalmology, the photosensitive uh, cells in the retina are rods and cones. So in 2002, researchers kind of revised this uh, facts, this knowledge, and they discovered that except of this, there are also some retinal ganglion cells that are uh, photosensitive. And these retinal ganglion cells that are photosensitive in the retina are responsible for our biological rhythms. So uh, for our sleeping, for our uh, consciousness for also uh, pupillary light reflex. So this is also kind of important from the neurological side because with the damage, certain damage in the, in the retinal optic nerve, we can better understand the defects in the pupillary light reflex. And another discovery in the retina the novel theory of glaucoma, which was formed by my team in 2018. This uh, novel theory, theory um, for glaucoma, not only in fact for glaucoma, because this can be applied to any neurodegeneration, to any neurodegenerative disease, so also for Alzheimer, Parkinson's, ALS, and many different. It's saying that over the age, there is failure of endogenous neuroprotection systems in the neurons. And the major neuroprotective system in the neurons, which we discovered, is related to RNA binding protein. And the biggest, the most important representation of these proteins is protein called HUR. 
And for this, currently, we are running studies uh, which are coming close to the clinical studies with the gene therapy for this protein. And talking about the gene therapies, uh, maybe you heard somewhere in news, there is a first uh, FDA and EMEA approved gene therapy commercially available for eye diseases. It's called Luxturna. This is adeno-associated virus carrying gene for uh, retinal uh, degeneration, retinal dystrophy called retinitis pigmentosa. Retinitis pigmentosa is like the most commonly seen retinal inherited retinal disease which cause blindness in early age. And delivery of the correct gene with this Luxturna system allows to restore some part of vision in blind patients. And this is something that was futurology some years ago. Now it's happening in the clinic. You can buy actually this as a treatment. Of course, it's extremely expensive. It costs several millions of Polish zlotych, but it's available. And the bionic eye. The bionic eye are represented by retinal implants that also can restore vision. These small, tiny retinal implants are surgically implanted under the macula of the retina, and they are connected with special uh, glasses with camera, and it works so that the camera detects, of course, everything which is in front of you. It sends the signal by wires to the retina, to this implant. This implant is transducing the signal from the camera into the impulses, and these impulses are then uh, transduced to the visual centers. Very complex, very burdensome surgery to implant these implants, but it can restore some part of vision to blind people. For example, if they are totally blind, after these implants they can see shapes or movements. Of course, they cannot see fully like we are seeing, but this is a huge progress forward for the blind people. And uh, at this point, I allow myself to finish this, uh, my boring scientific talk. And I would like to refer very briefly, very shortly to you and try to answer for the question which very often happens in the literature, how to succeed in science. How to succeed in science from your perspective, from perspective of student, because of course there is needed for whole environment around you that is favorable for your work. But as a student, you need to find your passion. You need to remember if you will start to working in science, if you will start doing some scientific work, it's very important that your scientific work is integral. So you work in one topic in one aspect. And because you work on this one aspect, it cannot be boring for you, right? So you need to find the aspect, the topic which is your passion. You should also find passionate supervisors. So this is also very important. You need to take any chance for training. And for example, SIMC is this kind of chance for training, for performing in front of audience, to fight with your stress, to uh, make you familiar with the way how to lead the, or answer the discussion. So this is really important. And also be brave and speak good English. English is the language of science. So if you don't speak good English, uh, it will be very difficult for you to find yourself in a big science. In my case, this kind of spark which let's say, uh, started everything, was one paper which I accidentally went through somewhere when I was finishing my medical study about the cell therapies for glaucoma. And I was thinking, why not try? Maybe it's something that I could do. I had no idea how difficult it will be. But I found passionate supervisors. 
The passionate uh, supervisors, the first one who kind of directed me was Professor Poida Wilczek, who was at that time the curator of the student association. And she kind of mm, enabled or her helped me to meet with my lifetime supervisor, I could say, uh, Professor Levin Kowalik, under whom I did my whole initial career, and my clinical supervisor, Professor Wilengawa, who made it possible to combine clinical work with the scientific uh, activities. And when it all started, it resulted in numerous of publications because I found a passion in what I'm doing. I found a passionate supervisors. I immediately started traveling for internships, fellowships abroad. I worked on my English. So everything brought the positive outcome. Nowadays, I'm leading my own team here at the university. We are working with molecular aspects of optic neuropathies, gene therapies, and neurodegeneration in, in uh, general. Currently, I am having a team of four people, but four more are coming. So there are calls for job. Feel invited. We are uh, working with three grant, with four grants from uh, uh, national Polish National Science Center, company-sponsored grants, some international grants. We have numerous of collaborators from all over the world, from Europe, from Asia, from Middle East, from United States, that we are actively collaborating. And also we are attending and participating in the most uh, prestigious eye research associations worldwide. And everything that happened here started here from this little spark in the beginning and my passionate supervisors. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I want to wish you a great conference. And also, last one uh, sentence which I would like to highlight, we all make future in science. So everything what you do now will have impact on the future scientific knowledge. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this passionating uh, and motivating uh, lecture. Uh, we have a small uh, conference uh, packet. Thank you very much for this lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we would also like to invite you to take part in our workshops that will be held tomorrow. Uh, in the topic of ultrasonography in anesthesiology. Registration will be possible at the registration office at the tomorrow morning. And we also invite you to take part on our Instagram giveaway. Our details are available on our Instagram, Simk Katowice. We hope this event will bring you a new experience and knowledge, and good luck at your scientific sessions. Thank you very much for coming. And the scientific sessions will be held, will, be, uh, will begin at 10 o'clock at the sessions you will find on our conference plan.
and Scientific Society of Medical University of Silesia in Katowice, I would like to thank you for coming and taking part into the International Medical Congress of Silesia 2022. My name is Aleksandra Mroskowiak and it is my great pleasure to coordinate neonatology and pediatric session. My name is Maria Stetz and it is also my great honor to coordinate the session of pediatrics and neonatology. I would like to cordially welcome the esteemed jury of our session, the president of the jury, Professor Małeska Tendera. <laughs> Professor Grzybowska Chlebowczyk. <laughs> Professor Maria Szczepańska. Good morning. Professor Iwona Maruniak Hudek. <laughs> Professor Justyna Paprowska. Assistant Professor Grażyna Sobol Milajska. Dr. Małgorzata Rusek. Dr. Aleksandra Antosz. And Dr. Anna Szczymańska. Dear participants, before we start the first prolection, let me explain to you the principles and the rules of the session. The order of the presentation will be the same as in the abstract book published before the conference. The maximum time for the presentation is seven minutes and three minutes for the discussion. If the presenter exceeds the time of the prolection, he or she needs to move to the conclusions and finish the presentation as soon as possible. Don't be afraid. I will tell you now gently that the time has just passed. Please remember that the whole presentation and the discussion must be run in English. Esteemed jury, I would like to kindly remind you that if you are the supervisor of the paper which is presented, you should not assess the work. In that case, please cross out the number on your card. Of course, other members of the same clinic can assess the presentation and the assessment will be verified. We kindly ask you to assess five actually four aspects of each prolection, scientific value, way of presenting, discussion and open contribution to the presentation. So when the session ends, we kindly ask you to give the cards back to the coordinators. Right. Professor Szczepańska, uh, because you participate in our session by the internet, I would be grateful if you send the filed report cards via email on the same address uh, which, from which you have received them. Yes, I understood. I, I will do it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so these are the rules and the regulation that we need to observe. But if something is unclear, I would be glad to answer any question you might have. If not, I think we can start with the first presentation. At the beginning, I would like to ask Michael Schroeter to present the paper entitled Supra, Supraten Supratentorial Cavernous Malformations in Children Indication for Surgical Intervention Postoperative Outcome. Uh, thank you very much, uh, and thank you for the opportunity to speak uh, at this Congress. Um, I want to present our paper on supratentoral cavernous malformation in children, uh, the indication for surgical intervention and the post-operative outcome in a short and long term after such interventions. As a quick uh, introduction, what are cavernous malformation, otherwise known as cavernoma? They are a type of a vascular, le a vascular lesion comprised of cluster of tightly packed abnormal fin walled small blood vessels. Usually the pathology, uh, they have a fin or porous uh, muscular la lamina, which me uh, leads to a continuous uh, slow leakage of blood around in the surrounding uh, healthy neurological tissue. Uh, the location in the supratentorial location is the most frequent. It's estimated that in the pediatric population, uh, 0.37 to 0.53% MRI in the SWI sequence is the preferred imaging modality uh, because of the characteristic uh, halo of hemosiderin around the, around the lesion. Additionally, one has to consider that in the pediatric uh, population, uh, 
uh, otherwise, uh, as in the adults, uh, those, uh, uh, those lesions tend to hemorrhage in a clinical significant amount. Uh, when we are considering uh, qualifying a patient for surgery, uh, the first primary uh, consideration is the localization of the lesion, easily accessible in neurologically uh, non-critical uh, uh, regions as well, or less accessible deep brain structures or neurologically crucial localizations. If we are dealing with easily accessible lesions, indications are focal neurological deficit, uh, symptomatic or giving clinical symptoms hemorrhage, uh, or seizures. Uh, in considering of seizures, we have to look at either uh, drug-resistant seizures or new on seizures because uh, the available literature suggests that uh, a swift removal uh, of such a lesion can prevent the so-called kindling effect, uh, heightening the chances of preventing future seizure for the patient. If we are dealing with lesions in less accessible locations, the indications are uh, progressively a neurological deterioration of the patient uh, and repeated bleeding of the cavernoma. As such, generally two viewpoints crystallize. On one hand, we have to consider that a, pa uh, a pediatric patient has a vastly longer life expectancy than adult patients, so the risk of complications uh, and bleeding and rebleeding of such lesions compounds over their entire lifetime. Uh, that means that even asymptomatic cases can be considered uh, for eventual uh, surgical intervention. On the other hand, one has to remember that pediatric patients tend to develop quicker uh, complications due to blood loss, or if uh, complete, uh, re complete resection of the lesion is impossible, uh, the risk of hemorrhaging increases. As I said, the aim of our studies is the analysis of indication of resection and the result of surgical treatment of supratentoral cavernous malformation in children. For that, we use a retrospective analysis of patients who underwent such a procedure in the Department of Pediatric Neurosurgery in Katowice in the years 2010-2021. We assess MRI uh, imaging studies, clinical manifestation, and treatment results in the short and long term. Our study population consisted of 22 patients, uh, 7 female, 15 male, average age 11 years, uh, standard deviation 5 years. Uh, for clinical manifestation, uh, the biggest homogeneous block consisted of seizures, the second of focal symptoms, uh, the biggest heterogenic group of symptoms uh, indicative of increased cranial pressure. Uh, also, two patients were of an incidental found because of uh, image studying done in aftercare after they had an accident. As for localization of the lesions, most often was the temporal lobe followed by the frontal and parietal lobe. Uh, one patient has had a deep structural localization in the basal nuclei. Uh, in our study population, three patients had multiple cavernous uh, malformation, which are indicative uh, of a genetic background. Currently, there are three known genetic uh, mutations, CCM1, which is the TRKI1 gene on the seventh chromosome, uh, CCM2, which is the NGC4607, also on the seventh chromosome, uh, and CCM3, which is the PDCD10 chromosome uh, mutation on the third chromosome. Uh, available literature points uh, that uh, multiple uh, cavernomas consist around 9 to 18 percent of the overall population of such lesions, so our group with their 13.6 percent uh, appears to be representative of that. Uh, in the MRI studies, 10 patients sh have shown recent, uh, recent signs of bleeding. Uh, their, their, their symptoms include uh, first in the lifetime seizures, as well as intracranial pressure uh, symptoms. Uh, three patients have shown new focal deficits. Uh, as for qualifying to surgery, 10 patients were qualified because of symptomatic bleeding uh, from the lesions, 6 patients due to drug-resistant seizures, 3, patient, three patients because of progressive focal deficits, and 3 patients were uh, qualified for surgery despite being asymptomatic. Uh, here, to, under consideration, was taking the uh, location uh, of the lesion as well as the expressed wishes of the parents. Uh, early outcome, which is an average of 7.5 days, which includes the uh, post-operative stay at the department's clinics. In the control MRI, uh, 21 cases uh, confirmed a complete resection. In one case, we have a partial resection, which was due to the deep brain uh, location that I already mentioned, as well as profuse bleeding during the operation, which made a complete resection impossible. 
uh, surgical treatment complications, we only had one uh, case of severe complications, which was 4.5% of our study group. Uh, we had a temporary worsening of the hemiplegia of the patient, as well as intracranial facial, facial nerve paresis and aphasia. Worth mentioning is that the patient already had hemiplegia before the operation, as well as a continuous deteriorating neurological state lead to the decision to try at least a partial resection. Uh, other complications were minor and all temporary, subcutaneous fluid collection, hearing impairment, during a temporal craniotomy, swelling of the forehead and eye socket during a frontal craniotomy, and temporary increase in inflammation markers. The long-term follow-up, which for us is an average of 43 months, uh, no patient have suffered on, on any re-bleeding, patient who had uh, seizures which via EEG were correlated with the location of the lesion, suffered no attacks after the operation, uh, every patient who uh, was qualified due to focal symptoms experienced either complete withdrawal, in one case only a, a partial withdrawal of the symptoms. Uh, the patients who were qualified due to uh, drug-resistant seizures, four patients have shown complete lack of seizure, two patients have shown improvement, no patient has shown uh, a lack of improvement of worsening. In the group of patients who lack complete seizure, uh, two are now reaching the 10-year mark without any epileptic attacks. Uh, to summarize our group, uh, I want to quickly introduce the modified ranking scale. It's a clinical scale used to judge the dependency on help uh, during daily activities, and that's, uh, that's split up points, uh, the less points is better, uh, 0, 1, and 2 means a favorable clinical outcome, 3, 4, and 5 uh, means a non-favorable outcome. Uh, patients in the one, uh, 0, 1, 2 group can uh, do all daily activities without help, 3, 4, 5 needs different degrees of help. As such, our complete group uh, in the modified ranking scale represents as follows. Uh, the overwhelming majority, blue-colored, had favorable clinical outcomes, with the biggest portion even having uh, zero points in the scale. Only one patient had three points, as again, this is the patient that already had hemiplegia before starting the procedure, which is the mm, biggest contributor to their, point, to their pointage in the scale. So in conclusion, in, this, in our study group, seizures, bleeding, and focal neurological deficits were the main reason for qualifying uh, for surgery. Surgical treatment of carinomas is an effective method to prevent future bleedings from the lesion location, as well as an effective method to treatment of seizures, which, for example, via EEG studies, are shown to be uh, correlated with the location of the, uh, the carinoma, as well as asymptomatic patients should be considered for surgical intervention. Uh, if the accessibility uh, of the lesion permits uh, and permits a safe, uh, safe, uh, safe procedure, as well with the uh, express wish of the patient's guardian. Thank you for your attention, and I invite questions, if any are. Do you have any questions? If I uh, could have a question. Yes, please. Uh, what was your uh, influence uh, into this uh, presentation? Uh, you uh, would like to be a surgeon, you will treat these patients? Uh, well, if I manage, I'll try to, I like to become a pediatric neurosurgeon, yes. So. Yeah, uh, and what other abnormalities uh, you observed in uh, that children? Because uh, it would be uh, possible to detect uh, this uh, uh, abnormalities earlier. So maybe you know any uh, congenital syndromes uh, connecting such lesions. Um, as I mentioned in the presentation, there is a possible genetic background uh, if we are dealing with uh, multiple cavernomas. Uh, we have three known genetic mutations, so if we are having a patient who has multiple carinomas, it's indication to uh, give the other, okay. uh, patient, the, other uh, the immediate family of the patient imaging studies, uh, ideally MRI, MRIs, uh, to see if they have such lesions. Thank you. Uh, okay, I have, I have several questions. So, uh, what were the most common uh, focal deficits you observe in your patient? Uh, Patients? Uh, Craniofacial nerve paralysis. Okay. Uh, what was the time from the MRI uh, confirmation of this malformation to the surgery? Um, 
uh, I know that a, a control MRI after operation is the 24-hour window after surgery. And before, uh, it depends because there was a separate um, individual qualification for the operation, so the time window varies rather, uh, varies rather. Of course, if there are symptoms that indicates intracranial, uh, in, uh, increase of intracranial pressure, that would uh, okay. shorten the window. Okay. Perhaps, yeah, generally, there's an uh, individual qualification to see. Okay, and uh, the last question. How you can define the drug-resistant epilepsy? Because it's a short period of observation. So you mean by number of anti-epileptic drugs or something else? Um, the uh, epilepsy was usually confirmed via an EEG, uh, but I think it's fair to say that they had epileptic attacks and not the, the time window, window is really uh, maybe a, a bit too short to call them seizures as such as, a, as the disease as such. But they had epileptic attacks that were confirmed to correlate with the location of the lesions in EEGs. Okay, because drug resistant epilepsy it means that uh, two anti epileptic drugs failed. Uh, yes, yes. Because mm -hmm. yes. uh, okay. there, there, like, there are two groups of, confirm, uh, uh, of qualification when it comes to seizures. One, it's the first uh, in the lifetime seizure. The location is confirmed via EEG, so to prevent the so-called kindling effect, we try to resect as quick as possibly. And then we have the second group, which is qualified because of drug-resistant seizures. So those, are, those people have a fully uh, diagnostic workup, had two, uh, two medications and uh, all the criteria are met to call them drug resistant seizures. Okay, and when you mentioned about partial improvement after uh, surgery, you mean uh, like 50%, uh, 75%, it was huge improvement or mm. more or less? When it comes to partial improvement, uh, there was one case and that was the uh, situ uh, of focal deficits. Uh, in that situation, the patient uh, had a regained partial control of, of the uh, But regarding epilepsy, it was... Uh, and, and in the epilepsy, uh, the most common was a drop in frequencies okay. of the attacks. Okay, thank you so much. I have some questions. I would like to ask you uh, if... May the cavernous malformations relapse? Uh, sorry, can you repeat your question? Uh, may the process relapse or not? Um, well, if the uh, lesion is completely removed, uh, complete resection, no spontaneous uh, regrowth should happen. Yes, uh, okay. Of course, uh, presence of one, uh, one um, such lesions may indicate the uh, may indicate that other lesions are present. So a full uh, imaging study uh, of the spinal cord as well as the brain should be done to uh, exclude other lesions. Mm. But if the resection is complete in that one location, mm. we should be safe. A relapse uh, mm -hmm. episode, of course. Thank you very much. Because we have to grade it, so we okay. have to know uh, what was your input. Uh, I suggest I know, but, but please <laughs> tell it. Uh, well. Uh, preparing the presentation as well as with my colleagues, I was working uh, on the logbooks uh, of the surgical logbooks of the department. Uh, we screened about 10 years of documentation, uh, found the patients that interest us. Uh, we uh, built and coherent a database, uh, and then did uh, follow up and uh, analysis of the available medical documentation. Okay, thank you. Fantastic. Okay. Congratulations. Uh, and yeah, my two colleagues. So uh, I was working on uh, finding prospective patients in the department's uh, surgi uh, surgical uh, lookbook in a uh, frame of 10 years. And I also was uh, collecting and analyzing data, uh, medical data, and of course the latest uh, follow-up. Uh, I worked on collecting and analyzing uh, medical documentation uh, as well as uh, collecting the long-term uh, follow-up uh, of patient, uh, patients uh, whom data was missing in hospital documents uh, via telephone contact. I found their families. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you for the discussion. So now I believe we can start with the second presentation. That's why I would like to invite Natalia, Natalia Semela with the paper, The Analysis of Clinical Course of Acute Pancreatitis in Children. The floor is yours.
Dear committee members, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming today. My name is Natalia Smela and I would like to bring your attention to our work titled The Analysis of Clinical Course of Acute Pancreatitis in Children. To completely understand the aim of our study, it's important to revise pathological pathways leading to acute pancreatitis in children. One of them is inappropriate activation of trypsinogen, followed by acute inflammation and necrosis of pancreas parenchyma, focal, necrosis, focal enzymic necrosis of pancreatic fat and vessels necrosis. Due to the pancreas lacking a capsule, uh, the um, inflammation and uh, necrosis can extend to fascial layers in the immediate vicinity of uh, pancreas. Onset of the disease is usually within 5 to 10 days, uh, and the most uh, common signs and symptoms are stomach, stomachache, uh, vomiting or diarrhea, jaundice and fever. The aim of our study was to analyze um, uh, causes, clinical picture including uh, complications uh, and treatment of acute pancreatitis in children. Moving to the next part, patients and methods. This study is a retrospective uh, analysis uh, of uh, 44 children, 50% boys and 50% girls, hospitalized in the Department of Pediatrics, Medical University of Silesia in Katowice between 2019 and 2021, um, diagnosed with acute pancreatitis. The, um, mean age uh, was 10.9 uh, years and the median hospitalization time was 9 days. Our results uh, were analyzed with the use of Statistica. Now let's take a look, take a look at our results. The most common cause was idiopathic, 36.4% uh, of patients. And other causes included genetic, biliary, anatomical defects and uh, by far the less common infections. Now let's, uh, I would like to bring your attention to the following graph that shows genetically determined causes of acute pancreatitis. Among them, uh, mutation of SPINK1 uh, was the most common. It occurred in four patients. Uh, less frequent were, were PRSS1 mutation in three child and CPA1 mutation in one child. And the most common signs were stomachache, vomiting, fever, and jaundice. And our study uh, has shown that um, the, in the most cases, uh, the, cause, the course of the disease was mild, but in 20.5% of pa patients, it turned out to be moderate or severe. Uh, and the clinical course strictly correlated with uh, median hospitalization time. Uh, patients with moderate or severe uh, pancreatitis were hospitalized longer than patients uh, with mild pancreatitis. Fifteen children had, uh, one, had more than one episode of acute pancreatitis, and acute recurrent pancreatitis were most observed uh, in children with genetic mutation coexisting with anatomical defects. 20.5% of patients were overweight. To illustrate the point that um, obesity is a risk factor of moderate or severe pancreatitis, uh, the correlation seen on the graph was made. Uh, among uh, overweight children, 44.4% uh, of patients um, had uh, worse outcome um, of the disease compared with 14.3% of patients uh, in a non-obese group. It was statistically significant that CRP level was higher in patients uh, with moderate or severe course of the disease and uh, in patients with infectious, um, infectious uh, causes. Statistical correlation has shown that amylase activity uh, is not dependent on the cause of the pancreatitis. Mm. The most common MRI, uh, MRI uh, findings were cysts, uh, edema and inflammatory uh, infiltration. By the other hand, there was ultrasound um, visualized uh, enlargement, virsung duct and pancreas, and as well as cysts. 
complications were observed in 18.2% of patients, and the most uh, common complications were the peripancreatic fluid collections, um, and other um, complications included pancreatic necrosis, infection of necrosing area, inflammatory infiltration, and pseudocysts. What about treatment? In the majority um, of patients, um, conservative management was uh, sufficient enough, um, but in 15 patients, uh, there was a need of uh, other uh, medical procedures. Five patients uh, underwent ERCP with sphinc sphincterotomy and placement of prothesis uh, of bili biliary duct, uh, and uh, 10 children uh, were treated surgically, uh, cholecystectomy was performed. And the last part, conclusions. Taking into account previous data from gastroenterology unit, the number of children diagnosed with acute pancreatitis increased over time. The most frequent causes uh, are genetic predispositions, uh, infections, and holothitis. Acute pancreatitis should be considered in every case of stomachache, vomiting, uh, or uh, fever in children. Thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, my team and I am here to answer them. Uh, of course, I have uh, the question. If it's possible, uh, yeah. So, uh, what is the indication for genetic testing uh, in acute pancreatitis? Excuse me, I didn't hear your question. Can you repeat, please, please? What is the indication for genetic testing in acute pancreatitis? Genetic, genetic test testing. Why do you perform in each patients? You perform genetic testing. Uh, so, in our patients, uh, genetic testing was performed uh, when a child had recurrent pancreatitis and also uh, when the cause was not known. For example, in children with biliary etiology, it was not necessary. So, uh, in other children with idiopathic etiology, uh, which we know is the etiology that we don't know what is the cause of the pancreatitis, the genetic tests were done. So um, several children who had some, more than one episode of acute pancreatitis, uh, during the first episode had the idiopathic cause, but then uh, when it was the second hospitalization, it was uh, revealed that it was genetic etio etiology. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and another question, uh, do you, uh, have you noticed any uh, correlation with COVID uh, infection and uh, acute pancreatitis? Uh, yes, uh, there were, uh, we had two children uh, who had idiopathic etiology, but we classified it as uh, possibly infectious etiology because we found uh, papers in the liter literature that are uh, saying that COVID may be associated with acute pancreatitis and maybe the cause of acute pancreatitis. Uh, so uh, in two children, it was suspected that it was infectious et etiology of pancreatitis and it was COVID. Yeah, thank you. I have uh, also one child with uh, this connection. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. So, uh, did you use any scale of, if yes, so what, what kind of scale to evaluate the severity of pancreatitis? Yes, we did. It was the ransom scale, uh, and we mm, divided the group into mild, severe, and uh, between. Uh, okay, but uh, what was the, you know, the factors for, uh, na podstawie których? Uh -huh, based on which you divided these children? Uh, Leucocities, <laughs> age, uh -huh. LHD, uh -huh. <laughs> and the amylases. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Do you have any information about the neonatal background? I mean, about any, any information about the failure to thrive or some problems with digestion during the neonatal period or in early infancy? 
What we about the history of this period uh, of time? We didn't have information about early infancy uh, in children who were diagnosed when they were older, uh, but uh, we had only uh, one child which was two years old, so only in this child we had uh, uh, information, but it was initial presentation of problems in this child was acute pancreatitis. Uh, but uh, in our work we noticed that um, genetic etiology commonly was uh, firstly, first uh, episode of acute pancreatitis was, was below 10 years old and it was statistically significant uh, difference. And in uh, children above 10 years old, uh, the etiology was more um, different, uh, differentiated. Uh, very, a lot of causes was uh, in children uh, above 10 years old, like biliary and others, but in children below 10 years old, it was uh, most of episodes was only genetic and idiopathic, so possibly this idiopathic are also genetic etiology. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much, and I would like to ask another presenter, and it will be Karolina Tracz, with the presentation Comparative Analysis of Clinical Presentation in the Novo Diagnosed Patients with Inflammatory Bowel Disease. Excuse me, it's not my presentation. Uh, their committee members, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Karolina Tracz. I represent Student Scientific Society at the Department of Pediatrics, Faculty of Medical Sciences in Zabrze at Medical University of Silesia in Katowice. And I would like to uh, present you the results of, of our study uh, called Comparative Analysis of Clinical Presentation in the Novo Diagnosed Patients with Inflammatory Bowel Disease. To begin with, uh, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis are two types of inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, both usually present at young age and strongly influence patients' quality of life. Given the fact that uh, IBD incidence has uh, significantly raised uh, in the past decade, that uh, it is very important to acknowledge the clinical presentation of our future patients. Uh, the clinical manifestation of uh, Crohn disease and ulcerative colitis may be very similar, yet they are totally, totally different diseases. Uh, for instance, uh, blood in the stool is more common in ulcerative colitis. On the other hand, um, the inflammation that may affect any part of gastrointestinal tract is more uh, common in uh, Crohn disease. Uh, moving to the aim of our study, we analyzed and compared atropometric data and the clinical picture of Crohn disease and ulcerative colitis uh, over 13 years among newly diagnosed patients in the Department of Gastroenterology and Pediatric Hepatology. And patients uh, have been divided into four groups. The first one consisted of 37, uh, 37 patients diagnosed with Crohn's disease uh, in 2008-2011. The next group uh, involved uh, also 37 patients diagnosed with Crohn's disease, but diagnosed later uh, in 2018-2011. 21. Next, we have group C, which is uh, which was consisted of 33 patients diagnosed with ulcerative colitis in 2008-2011, and uh, finally we have the last group, which consisted of 37 patients diagnosed, sorry, uh, with also ulcerative colitis in 2018 and 2021. Uh, we gathered and compared gender, age, weight, height, and BMI of our patients. Uh, also, duration of symptoms to the diagnosis, location, and disease activity, activity were taken into account, and statistical analysis was performed using the statistical program. Uh, considering patients diagnosed in 2018 and 2021, we observed that uh, Crohn's disease is more common in boys, while the ulcerative colitis is uh, more characteristic uh, in girls, which was statistically significant, and we also uh, observed that in our studies. Um, uh, collecting the anthropometric data, we found, that, we found out that in the, the group A and B, which are the patients diagnosed with Crohn's disease, 
uh, the mean wide SDS and BMI SDS were lower than in a group C and D, which are the patients diagnosed with ulcerative colitis, and it was also significant, statistically significant. Uh, moving to the duration of the symptoms, uh, before the diagnosis, it was shorter in a group uh, C and, uh, than in a group A, and in a group D than in a group A, uh, which means that uh, the ulcerative colitis is diagnosed earlier than, than Crohn's disease. Uh, to measure the activity of both diseases, to measure the Crohn's disease activity, we use, we use this pediatric Crohn's disease activity index, which we have on the slide. And uh, it is divided into four stages depending on the score the patient gets to inactivate, mild, moderate, moderate and severe. And in our study, we observed that severe activity, activity of the disease at the time of the diagnosis was significantly higher in the group A than in the group B. And uh, also we uh, compared the localization, uh, or location of Crohn's disease and the extent of ulcerative colitis using this uh, periscale classification. And for the uh, location of Crohn's disease, we have distal one third ileum, uh, colium, and ileocolonic. And uh, considering the extent of ulcerative colitis, we have ulcerative proctitis, left-sided uh, ulcerative colitis, extensive and pancolitis. And uh, we showed that the the ileocolonic location in Crohn's disease is more common, while the, the extensive type of the disease in ulcerative colitis is, uh, is also the most common, and this trend has not changed do, during the, during the, uh, over the years. And it is well known that Crohn's disease can affect any part of the gastrointestinal tract, also the upper gastrointestinal, uh, including oral cavity, esophagus, and stomach. And we observed that uh, that in a group B, uh, it, was, it was higher than in a group A, and it was at the border of the stati statistical significance. And uh, to sum up, we have three conclusions uh, worthy to point out. The first one is that ulcerative colitis is diagnosed faster than the Crohn disease. Moreover, patients diagnosed with Crohn disease have lower body weight and BMI than the patients diagnosed with ulcerative colitis. And finally, the diagnosis of severe Crohn disease activity over 13 years has decreased. Uh, the fact that ulcerative colitis is diagnosed faster than the Crohn disease may result from more alarming symptoms, such as lower gastrointestinal bleeding. And what is important, this has not changed over the years. Uh, patients diagnosed with Crohn's disease may lower body weight and BMI than patients diagnosed with ulcerative colitis. Um, it may result from, um, from that, that for Crohn's disease is uh, mal malabsorption, limited diet, and symptoms such as diarrhea, they are really common. So that may cause uh, the results. Also, a longer duration of symptoms before, before the diagnosis was, was important, and also we observed that in our study. And this has not changed over the years also. And the last one, uh, the diagnosis of severe Crohn's disease activity over, over the 13 years has decreased, probably due to the better pediatric care, better diagnosis, and faster access to a specialist. And thank you very much for your attention, and feel free to ask me any questions. Uh, okay, so uh, I would like to ask you about this, uh, um, this Crohn disease because it's very interesting that uh, the, the first, this earlier one group, uh, was, uh, the, the activity was more, aggressi more aggressive, was more severe, but what about the uh, body mass index? Yes, because I know that it is in this, include in this uh, activity index also, but did you notice that nowadays this Crohn's disease is maybe not so uh, seen and, and the uh, body mass index is uh, better also? So I think the body mass index is higher, uh, but uh, not significantly higher. Uh, but uh, I think it's, uh, it depends on um, how uh, the child is um, diagnosed and uh, what symptoms uh, it has. Because uh, um, 
it depends uh, is it, if it has uh, severe symptoms or not, or not, but I don't think it was uh, much different. Uh, I asked earlier. about it because uh, uh, nowadays we don't, uh, we, we don't see so many uh, children with Crohn's disease and uh, with um, a lot, uh, uh, big loss of body mm -hmm. weight. With yes, underweight. so nowadays they are better in better condition, yes, generally, mm -hmm. probably because of the earlier, uh, uh, earlier diagnosis. Mm -hmm. yes. Thank you. Yes, please. Thank you. I have one question, but probably I have missed the uh, information. So um, what was the average time to the diagnosis in these two patients group? You mean the age? Yes. Uh, I think the youngest patient in Crohn's disease has uh, he was like six years old, and the, uh, the youngest in ulcerative colitis was two, and the, the oldest one was 18 in both. Mm -hmm. both but what groups. was the uh, exact time or average time to the diagnosis? Mm. Yes. Uh, it was 10 months uh, in Crohn disease and about six uh, and five months in colitis ulcerosa. Okay, very quickly. Thank you. Do you have any more questions? If not... Thank you for the presentation. And now we can move on to the presentation entitled Clinical Course of the Celiac Disease Among Patients Hospitalized from 2019 till 2021 by Natalia Levoniuk. Sorry for our small error in terms of the order. Ladies and gentlemen, dear committee, my name is Natalia Levoniuk, and today I have a pleasure to present you our work. <laughs> okay, some technical problems. Uh, oh, today I have a pleasure to present you our work about clinical course of uh, celiac disease among patients hospitalized in the Department of Pediatric in 2019 to 2021. As we all know, celiac disease is an autoimmune condition caused by reaction to ingested gluten among people with genetic predisposition. The symptomatology of a disease is very rich and symptoms may vary from typical symptoms like uh, abdominal pain and other gastric symptoms to no symptoms at all, which may lead to difficulties in the diagnosis and the delay of the proper diagnosis. The aim of our study was to evaluate clinical picture, results of laboratory tests and diagnostic imaging by retrospective analysis of clinical data collected from 37 patients hospitalized in gastroenterology unit. The inclusion criterion was the diagnosis of a celiac disease. The patients was diagnosed uh, based on two criterion, criteria, uh, first was the elevated 10 times above the normal range uh, tissue transglutaminase antibodies and positive uh, anti-endomysial antibodies. And the second group was, uh, the diagnosis was based on the endoscopic uh, results and the biopsy. Our study group consisted mainly of girls, as we, as we can see on the diagram and the mean age was around eight years old. Uh, the celiac disease was uh, diagnosed mostly in patients are, uh, over six years old. As for the symptoms, uh, most was, what's crucial, most of the patient's most frequent symptom was lack of a symptom at all, which may then uh, delay the diagnosis. Other common symptom was abdominal pain, uh, Furthermore, uh, the patient admit, was admitted because of the underweight or lack of a weight gain, decreased appetite, constipation, chronic diarrhea, vomiting, and others. Although, over, um, oh, although almost 60% of our patient was in, within normal weight range, what's worth noting is that 
over one third of them was underweight or ambition. The most common uh, abnormalities in um, laboratory tests were iron deficiency, present in 60% of examined. Uh, also, anemia was present in 50% of examined patients. 11% uh, has decreased total protein levels. Another frequent abnormality detected was uh, lowered vitamin D levels, which occurred in, all, in over two-thirds of examined patients. 10% has lower calcium level, and, uh, and also one patient has increased transaminases. The endoscopy was performed in 21 patients, and what's surprising, it showed uh, visible macroscopic changes in most cases, which is not typical in children. The changes included erosion of the top parts of duodenal folds, decreased number or flattening of duodenal folds, mosaic structure, and swollen duodenal folds. In seven patients, no typical macroscopic changes were detected. The histopathology results uh, revealed typical changes for celiac disease, and the patient was mostly classified, classified uh, in MARS score as 3C, which indicates total VLE atrophy. Uh, in four patients, no typical changes were noted. Most frequent comorbidities detected in our study group was diabetes type 1, AGI deficiency, and autoimmune thyroid disease, which indicates that in these three groups, uh, diagnostics should be performed. To conclude, uh, celiac disease is a very rich in symptomatology disease. Uh, symptoms may vary from typical symptoms, which we know from books, and also not typical symptoms, and a lot of patients have, may have no symptoms at all. In our study group, it was over 30% of the patients. This may lead to delay in diagnosis and malnutrition, and therefore to certain deficiencies, and in the long run, to serious complications. In our case, the most uh, common deficiencies was iron deficiency in 60% of the patients and vitamin D deficiency in over 70% of the patients. Therefore, it's so important to determine the risk groups and perform proper diagnostic tests in order there to implement dietary treatment as quickly as possible and prevent further, comp further complications. Thank you for your attention. If you have any further questions, I will gladly answer them. Oh, thank you for a beautiful presentation. I have one technical remark. It's not really a question. You presented the age of the children. I think it was the 10th <laughs> uh, uh, data after the, the uh, second sli third slide. You see, oh, here, mean. You see the age, don't present it to more than 8.7 because it's, it looks really strange, you know. Yeah, because it's uh, <laughs> it's calculated. I know it's yeah. statistical, but yeah. don't do that. If you are yeah. going to present your data, uh, you know, try to cut it down to one uh, uh, number after the one decimal point. Okay, because yeah, it, because it's, it's a picture from statistical program. And yeah, but, yeah, yeah, but, but I know, you know, I know. this you. is the yeah. work of statistician, but yeah. you are the one <laughs> who is going yeah. to present it. Then the, uh, the second thing is, you said that 41% uh, of uh, children did not have any symptoms. So why did they go to the pediatrician or to the uh, <laughs> gastroenterologist if they had no symptoms at all? They were patients from the risk groups. Uh, they were mostly patients with uh, diabetes type 1 and also patients with uh, IgI okay. deficiency. So therefore they were diagnosed uh, for celiac disease. Okay, okay, because I, I didn't, when, uh, didn't catch it. One or two it. patients has family member with celiac disease and they were diagnosed. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> Congratulations, uh, and I have the question, what was the indication for endoscopy in your uh, patients? 
the endoscopy was performed in patients that uh, the trans anti and trans and tissue transglutaminase antibodies that were lower than 10 times uh, upper normal limit. Uh, like they were elevated, but they were not uh, elevated 10 times above the normal limit. So therefore, the endoscopy should be performed to confirm the diagnosis. Thank you. I would like to ask about potential celiac disease. Uh, how many children uh, have it, has it? And uh, it was what was, uh, did, did they have any symptoms or not? Yes, uh, it was diagnosed in four children. Uh, two of them uh, has uh, diabetes type 1, and, uh, and also one with diabetes had autoimmune thyroid disease, and two of the children had abdominal pain and was diagnosed because of that. Thank you. Thank you for all of the questions. Okay, thank you very much for all the questions. And I would like to ask another presenter, uh, Anna Bielawska, and she will perform the presentation evaluation of the effectiveness of the Minimet 780G HAHCL system after six months of use. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, dear jury, and my fellow colleagues. My name is Anna Bielawska, and on behalf of the Department of Children's Diabetology, I'm honored to present our study, the evaluation of the effectiveness of the Minimed TM780 GAHCL system after six months of use. Shall we begin? Nowadays, more and more children are being diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. There is no doubt that this insulin-dependent disease requires lifelong treatment. By achieving recommended glycemic targets, we can reduce or even prevent acute and long-term complications of this disorder. Referring to very well-known facts of the evidence-based medicine, there is no more effective method of treating type 1 diabetes than using insulin pump therapy. Recently introduced technology called Advanced Hybrid Closed Loop System became a breakthrough among currently available methods of treating type 1 diabetes and it has improved the quality of patient's life. The aim of our study was to uh, present and perform analysis of the glycemic metrics in patients with type 1 diabetes treated with AHCL system uh, at the beginning of using this technology and after six months. Here, let me show you how the pump really look like and the mobile application, which we will discuss later. The Minimed TM780G system is a second generation advanced hybrid cross loop that received CE mark approval and it uh, in June 2020 and it is available in Poland since the end of December 2020. Uh, you can wonder what makes this technology so outstanding. So let me tell you. Uh, the Minimed TM780G system uh, contains an advanced uh, hybrid closed loop system and algorithm that incorporates innovations derived from the Minimed TM670G uh, system. The new future of this technology is an automatic system with a precise uh, and automatically adjusted uh, dose of basal insulin and automatic correction boluses every five minutes, 24-7, uh, based on a real-time uh, continuous glucose monitoring values. First of all, AHCL system uh, technology greatly re reduces the, pa the patient's obligation. The system helps to keep your glucose level in range, even if the carb counting isn't exact, and without the need to prick your finger. 
What's more, what's more, autocorrection can cover your occasionally missed uh, insulin dose to meals. And apart from this, by entering carbs to this program, the pump will calculate your needed insulin dose. Due to this, uh, AHCL system greatly improves the quality of patient's life by reducing the chance of calculation mistakes. Thanks to the rapid technological uh, progress and uh, common access to electronic devices, there is also an option to view a real-time glucose monitoring and trends on your mobile phone. Moving on to materials and methods, our database from the Minimed TM780G system included 50 patients. The mean age was 12 years old and four months uh, with five years uh, standard deviation. Duration of diabetes was five years and three months, uh, as you can see here. And uh, they all uh, been using AHC technology for at least six months. Records of these patients were collected from the visit to the Department of Children's Diabetology, as well as from the Medtronic CGM Carlink uh, system and software. Uh, only users with the sensor use value above 70% were included in the study. And we compared the first two weeks of using AHCL system uh, and the two weeks after six months of using this technology. Um, as you can see here also, uh, the BMI remain unchanged. So there is no need to be concerned about gaining weight due to insulin uh, therapy. During those six months of using AHC uh, technology, patients ma maintain proper metabolic uh, controls uh, in terms of sensor glucose average, as we can see here, and it was about 130 milligrams per deciliter. Also, glucose management indicator, which is evaluated glycated uh, hemoglobin, and it was below 6 and 5 percent, which is a great result. Also, the coefficient of variation remained unchanged and it's below uh, 36 percent, which means the glycem glycemic uh, metrics were stable. What's interesting, automode use increased from 91 and 9 percent to 96 and 6 percent, which uh, is an important aspect and is a great also result. So, in conclusion, uh, the main conclusion, uh, our patients have achieved recommended glycemic metrics after six months of using AHCL technology, the Minimet TM, uh, and uh, that's the real, co that's the main, uh, main conclusion. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention, and uh, we're happy to answer your questions. Do you have any questions? Uh, I wonder what was the youngest patient in your group? Uh, the youngest patient in our group was seven years old because the AHCL this pump uh, is for uh, older children from uh, six years and above. Uh, is there any um, weight limit? Excuse me? Is there any weight limit or age limit? Do you say that? Um, the limit seven? is a dose of basal insulin. It's eight, uh, it's eight of insulin. So uh, it's a big dose for small children. So this is the... Uh, Technical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. How long you can use this uh, um, device for? So, I mean, if you insert uh, the, the sensor, it can be put in the tissue for how long? Uh, if you put the sensor uh, in your body, yeah. uh, you have to. Uh, uh, you have to. You can only wear this for uh, three days, yes. and you have to put the new one. Okay. So every three years, you have to uh, change your sensor from okay. your body. Okay, and it can be done by the parents, or it has to be done at the, in, in the hospital. 
Uh, no, it can be made by parents or uh, older uh, children do it, use it, do them, do it uh, it's simple, themselves I because think. it's easy. It's, it's easy. a special uh, mechanic that you only just to push mm -hmm. and it everything makes uh, by yourself. Mm -hmm. So it's very easy and you can do it uh, at home. Uh, do you know what is the longest time of observation using this uh, device and this uh, with these sensors? Uh, this uh, this pump is available in Poland from the end of December 2020. So our uh, yeah, so our the longest time is from the end of December because we have uh, first patients who a year and a half okay. been using yes. Okay. From Thank this you very time. much. Thank you so much. Is it, is it covered by the health system, or do they have to? Pay no, for this pump isn't covered. It's full uh, fully paid by patients, and it costs about. Uh, 20,000 uh, Polish water, so it's very expensive. But the, uh, the and one also and also the sensors that you have to change. Yes, right? the sensors are covered. Ah, the so sensors only the pump, are only, only the pump, the pump. Uh, okay. is paid. But the uh, first, because this is the second generation, the first generation 670 is covered uh, by uh, health. Uh, Polish health uh, mm. industry. So, so it's not for everybody. Just yeah, for it's not for everybody. Only. But uh, we hope in future it will be fully uh, free <laughs> for everybody. Okay, thank you. Uh, we've also wanted to highlight a very important fact for us that uh, our patients achieved uh, the best metabolic control and the glycemic metrics from all the currently available uh, studies. So it's the fact that we can be really proud of and it motivates us to extend uh, the, our study for more group and maybe for a, maybe we could finally found this uh, mentioned uh, artificial pancreas. So thank you for your attention. You work close with this, right? Yes. yes. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for the discussion. Thank you. So now is the turn of Jagoda Perlikowska. We invite you to deliver the presentation of neutro on neutropenia following intravenous immunoglobulin, immunoglobulin sorry, therapy in pediatric patients with immune thrombocytopenia. Please, the floor is yours. Uh, ladies and gentlemen and esteemed jury, uh, my name is Jagoda Perlikowska and I have a pleasure to represent the Student Society of the Department of Chematology and Pediatric Oncology in Zabrze uh, and Medical University of Silesia and I'm delighted to be here today to tell you about our original study uh, neutropenia following intravenous immunoglobulin therapy in pediatric patients with immune thrombocytopenia. Uh, let me start with some general information uh, on uh, immune thrombocytopenia. Uh, ITP is caused by uh, autoantibodies against platelet membrane uh, antigens and opsonized platelets are phagocytosed by reticuloendothelial system causing thrombocytopenia. Uh, pediatric patients uh, commonly may exhibit um, um, symptoms such as PTCA, mucosal bleeding, or easy bruising. Moreover, uh, ITP is a self-limiting condition uh, which spontane spontaneously remits in about 85% of uh, patients, uh, regardless of the treatment used. Uh, whereas the sources point to the risk of serious bleeding uh, as the reason for ITP treatment uh, in children. Uh, First-line pharmacological treatment, uh, including steroids and intravenous immunoglobulin, um, uh, provides faster rise in platelet count. However, uh, they may cause some side effects, and it has been um, observed that some children with ITP uh, treated with IVIC uh, developed neutropenia. Uh, neutropenia is classified as uh, mild, moderate, or severe, uh, depend based on the neutrophil count, as you can see on the slide. 
Uh, and the aim of our study uh, was to investigate the association between IVIC and neutropenia in pediatric ITP. Uh, let me now switch to the materials and methods. Uh, the retrospective uh, cohort study uh, involved 123 patients uh, with ITP who underwent uh, IVIC therapy uh, in the Department of Comatology and Pediatric Oncology in Zabrze uh, between uh, April 20, uh, 2014 and December uh, 2021. Um, and um, 79 of them were female and 44 uh, were male, uh, with an average age of uh, 8.03, with standard devi deviation uh, of uh, 4.55 years, uh, ranging from 0.8 to 17.9 uh, uh, years. Um, and uh, patients uh, with neutropenia on admission were excluded from the study, uh, and the p-value of less than uh, 0.05 uh, was considered as statistically significant. And let no, let's now turn to the results. Um, um, the mean total dose of IVIC uh, was uh, 1.7 gram, uh, grams per kilogram body weight. Uh, with standard deviation of 0.38 um, grams per kilogram body weight. Uh, and the median platelet count on admission uh, reached uh, 18,000 uh, per micro microliter. Uh, our data shows that a significant increase in uh, platelet level uh, usually uh, was observed usually um, exactly in more than 67% of children uh, on the first day after initial uh, administration of IVIC. Uh, and after the course of IVIC, uh, neutropenia was observed in 50 children, uh, which was 40.7% uh, of all patients. Uh, and uh, if you look at the uh, second chart, um, second chart, um, uh, you can see that uh, 58% uh, of uh, them uh, was diagnosed with mild, 28% uh, of them with moderate, and 14% uh, with severe neutropenia. Uh, uh, neutropenia occurred uh, mostly uh, on the first day after administration of IVIC in 54% uh, of patients. Uh, and it should be emphasized that uh, none of the subjects had a significant uh, infection during or immediately after the neutropenic episode. Uh, based on our findings, uh, there was a positive correlation between the onset of IVIC inducted neutropenia uh, and lower age of patients. Um, and uh, also, uh, neutro uh, also uh, the pretreatment neutrophil count in a group of patients with neutropenia was significantly lower uh, than in a group of patients without neutropenia after uh, IVIC therapy. Uh, and to illustrate differences been, uh, between mean neutrophil levels, uh, we decide to convert neutrophil counts into logarithm to obtain uh, a distribution similar to normal. Uh, and the graph, uh, I think, perfectly shows that patients with neutropenia after IVIC therapy initially had a lower uh, neutrophil count. And what's more, uh, the decline uh, in the neutrophil level uh, in that group of patients with neutropenia uh, is much sharper. Mm. And uh, there was no statistically significant correlation between the occurrence of neutropenia and gender of the patients. Uh, or um, total IVIC dose uh, size uh, of, okay, here, here, okay. Uh, there was no statistically, statistically significant correlation between the occurrence of neutropenia and gender of the patients, uh, or uh, total IVIC dose size or uh, platelet count uh, on admission. Uh, and to uh, sum up uh, everything, uh, sum up uh, the main points, uh, first of all, intravenous immunoglobulin therapy in children with ITP can lead to neutropenia. And patients uh, get noticeable benefits from IVIC therapy, but uh, uh, 
um, uh, and this uh, case tends to be a transient self-limiting condition. Um, there is a positive correlation between onset of neutropenia and lower age of patients or lower pretreatment neutrophil count. And this is our bibliography. Uh, thank you for listening. It was a pleasure to be uh, here today. And now I'm inviting you and my co-authors uh, to the discussion. Thank you. Does any of member of the jury have any questions? Uh, it's very interesting study, very nice presentation too, but I have a, a little comment. You should uh, use full name of the disease. The full name is primary immune thrombocytopenia. Not only immune from thrombocytopenia, but primary immune from thrombocytopenia. Yes, sorry, but uh, we get an information that the name of the disease had uh, changed mm -hmm. from immune uh, thrombocytopenia to, yeah, um, to the name we uh, used in our presentation in the last, I don't know, two years, maybe? As I know, as a hematologist, <laughs> the actual name Thank is you. primary immune from cytopenia. <laughs> okay, we get, okay. In the articles we searched um, from uh, last two years. Okay, maybe, thank you for the advice. <laughs> Okay, I would like to ask you um, if uh, the patients uh, uh, need the further uh, treatment, if the, uh, the immune therapy was the only tre treatment for, for these patients. Uh, how many pa patients need the further treatment? I, I, I mean the steroid therapy, of course. Okay, our pa patients, uh, we didn't um, focus on the um, medicaments okay. uh, used okay. in the therapy, mm -hmm. but uh, most of uh, our patients um, um, had uh, steroids therapy uh, and also um, uh, vitamin uh, D, C uh, and B uh, were uh, conducted and also some uh, etamcelate to uh, protect uh, from uh, hemor um, hemorrhage and uh, also um, painkillers and um, cetrons to avoid uh, vomiting after IV administration. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your answer. Mm -hmm. Is there any other question? from the jury. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so the next presentation is primary hypertension, a prevailing model of hypertension in children, single center study by Martina Stobiecka. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, esteemed jury. My name is Martina Stobiecka, and I would like to present you the results of our study, Primary Hypertension, a prevailing model of hypertension in children. My presentation is divided into five parts. I begin with the background information, then I would like to draw your attention to the aim of our study. Later, we will look at the materials and methods, and I present you the results. Finally, we'll move on to the conclusions. First, I would like to give you some background information about pediatric hypertension. Primary hypertension, whose exact cause is still unknown, is the diagnosis of exclusion. But it is most likely in children who are overweight or obese and have family history of hypertension. Secondary hypertension, um, whose exact cause is identified, it's, uh, whose exact cause is identified, uh, the most common one is renal disease. Uh, okay, the most interesting fact that seems to be crucial is that while in adults, primary hypertension is, the, um, is the, a dominant model of hypertension, in children it used to be attributed to underlying causes. However, with increasing rates of obesity in children and adolescents, uh, the proportion of primary hypertension increases. It is also important to note that the diagnosis of hypertension in EAF uh, increases the risk for hypertension, cardiovascular disease, and organ damage in adulthood. Let me move on to the aim of the study. 
the aim of our study was to determine the proportion of primary hypertension, secondary hypertension, and white coat hypertension among children sent to referral center due to uh, diagnosis established during routine health care. Uh, uh, children were diagnosed according to the guidelines of the pediatric section of the Polish Society of Hypertension based on 2016 European Society of Hypertension recommendations. Let's look at the materials and methods. The study conveyed 275 patients with no previous history of se uh, with no previous history of conditions underlying secondary hypertension. Children were admitted to the pediatric nephrology ward in Zabrze between 2016 and 2021 uh, upon, uh, mm, uh, with hypertension that was established upon office measurements. Rega uh, according to diagnostic recommendations, screening included confirmation of hypertension or white coat hypertension with use of ambulatory blood pressure monitoring or multiple automatic measurements, evaluation of organ damage, such as left ventricular hypertrophy or albuminuria, basic laboratory tests to exclude secondary hypertension, as well as anthropometric measurements uh, adjusted to percentiles. Okay, uh, this, in this slide, the table shows compiled current recommendations for screening, uh, for, screening uh, for hypertension in children. And let's turn our attention to the results. Uh, the pie graphs show the number of patients uh, with confirmed diagnosis of hypertension and those classified as white coat hypertension. As you can see, hypertension was confirmed in 71% of cases, while white coat hypertension was uh, recognized in 29% of cases. Going further with the outcomes, let's move on to the next slide. Um, patients with proven hypertension were divided into two groups, uh, patients with primary hypertension and patients with secondary hypertension. As you can see, primary hypertension was diagnosed in 83% of cases, so in 161 uh, patients, and secondary hypertension was uh, diagnosed in 17% of cases, so in 34 patients. Uh, having these results, we decided to make further observations. As you can see, uh, boys represent uh, the larger part of hypertensive patients. Uh, what is interesting, the study also shows that boys constitute the biggest percentage of patients with primary hypertension, because 70%. Mm. As you can see here in the graph, uh, we can, uh, we can observe how many of uh, the patients in the study had body weight greater or equal 90th percentile of BMI. Uh, the significant finding is that up to 68% of patients with primary hypertension were diagnosed with excessive body weight. Uh, okay, here uh, in the slide, the, mm, the charts show uh, in how many patients there was a positive family history of hypertension. So uh, we took under consideration uh, the uh, parents, grandparents, and siblings. And uh, the study reveals that uh, family history of hypertension was present in 51% of patients with white coat hypertension, in 53% of patients with secondary hypertension, and in 61% of patients with primary hypertension. Okay, uh, after the results, I would like to conclude our study. Uh, we all should be aware that the uh, etiology of uh, hypertension in children has changed over the years, and our study indicates that primary hypertension is the most common type in children diagnosed for hypertension that was recognized during routine healthcare. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. And if you have any questions, please free, feel free to ask. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. I, I was not quite sure if I, underst I understood it well. Uh, because you 
considered the white coat hypertension as a real hypertension? Or because, you know, if, if this hypertension does not confirm to be present mm -hmm. in other conditions, it's not really a hi hypertension, or do I have a wrong sight of that? Uh, because I, I would exclude that. I would say this is not a hypertension, right? Yes, it's not a hypertension. It's uh, just... Uh, it's. Um, Okay, so patients with um, higher blood pressure uh, in office measurements uh, were reported to our department and we had to exclude that the cause of hypertension is emotional and uh, the main examination is ABPM, so in this uh, examination we can exclude the emotional component and in our study we saw that uh, almost 30% of patients reported to our department had no hypertension, and I think it's a, a very interesting fact, and maybe something we should be aware of um, while we measure um, measure uh, blood pressure in children. Yeah, so it, one of the conclusions should be that the primary care physician should not send the children after measuring just once their blood pressure to the specialist, right? because they should really keep recording it to yes, be sure course, it's not yes. a real real hypertension. Okay, the second question is you, you reported the increase of the overweight. Some of these children probably were quite obese because you used a very nice uh, description, <laughs> excessive weight. Some of them probably were quite obese. And uh, did you find any correlation between the degree of obesity uh, and, and hypertension? And, yes, and of you, course. Yeah, according so the to more obese they were, they were more prone to have hypertension, or, or, or you didn't. Maybe you just didn't uh, well, examine now, that. You, for now, we don't have such data, but mm. we uh, we have the correlation between between higher blood pressure and higher uh, body mass index. Mm. And I presume you had the right measuring cuff for obese children, right? The, the very yes, broad, of course, broad of one. Course. <laughs> yes, it's very important. <laughs> Yeah, okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Do you have any information about the very early uh, developmental period of these children? I mean, uh, what about prematurity and in, um, intrauterine uh, growth restriction uh, diagnosed in the early neonatal period? Did you have any information in the history of, of, of these patients yeah. with, with primary hypertension? I'm not sure if I understood. Uh, could you um, repeat, please? I would like to know if mm -hmm. some of these patients with primary hypertension mm -hmm. have the have the history mm -hmm. of prematurity or intrauterine growth restriction uh, during pregnancy. Well, uh, well, yes, okay, you <laughs> during pregnancy. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, we also uh, we checked in the medical history uh, for that, and we uh, here we don't have such data, but there is uh, a link between prematurity and um, early uh, yogurt <laughs> intrauterine growth restriction or SGA. <laughs> yes, uh, <laughs> and uh, and uh, primary blood pressure. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for all the questions. Thank you for your presentation. Okay. <laughs> thank you for the presentation. So now I invite Karolina Kleszczewska to deliver the presentation on quality of life in children with inflammatory bowel disease during the COVID-19 pandemic. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Karolina Kleszczewska and it is my pleasure to present you our research work about quality of life in children with inflammatory bowel disease during the COVID-19 pandemic. The inflammatory bowel disease is a term mainly described two conditions, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease uh, is affects uh, from the mouth to the colon of our digestive system, while ulcerative colitis uh, affects only the colon. The symptoms of IPD 
are blood in stool, diarrhea, stomach cramps, and weight loss. But why we check the quality of life? This is very important uh, to know uh, whether the currently available treatment is efficient enough. And uh, it is also important to ensure that quality of life of children uh, with IBD uh, doesn't have different from that of non-affected children, and they can have normal life without being restricted by a disease. Our study group uh, consisted of 34 children with IBD aged 7 to 18 years old, and our control group had 77 children unaffected by disease aged 7 to 18 years old. We managed to get two certified questionnaires as well as users' uh, license agreement for them, and we also created our own questionnaire to measure the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on children with IBD. Here we can see the uh, first certified questionnaire. It's pet school uh, questionnaire, which was uh, completed by children and parents uh, of those children from both uh, study and control group. Uh, parents from both groups uh, completed on the quality of their children's lives. And uh, thanks to that, we could uh, compare the children's and parents' opinion. Here we can see the impact-free specific questionnaire for children with IBD. And uh, this questionnaire was completed only by those uh, children. And here on the bottom, uh, we can see our uh, own COVID-19 uh, questionnaire, which was completed by uh, all, uh, both study and uh, control group. We carried out all questionnaires ourselves, uh, and uh, our control group was uh, uh, completed uh, in uh, the, uh, several different vaccination points, while our study group's uh, questionnaires uh, were conducted at the gastroenterological clinic at Clinical Hospital in Zabrze. Uh, and our statistical analysis uh, was performed uh, by um, Statistica software. Uh, now I would like to show you the results of our work. Uh, now we will see the PetSQL results. Uh, here uh, we compared uh, children from study and control group. As we can see, uh, almost all ratings are uh, similar. Only one school functioning is statistically uh, lower, and it was uh, statistically lower uh, among uh, children with IBD. On the next two slides, I will show you the comparison of children and parents' opinion uh, of uh, the quality of life. Uh, here, uh, the we can see the uh, study group, and uh, children and parents' opinion uh, was uh, similar in all dimensions. And here we, here we can see the control group. And it is interesting that uh, parents' opinion in each dimension uh, was statistically lower than the opinion of their children. Here we can see the impact-free results. We uh, divided our study group into uh, two smaller groups, uh, children with Crohn's disease and children with uh, colitis ulcerosa. And uh, all, uh, we compared both uh, groups. And as we can see, uh, all uh, ratings are similar. Only one, emotional functioning, uh, was statistically lower, and uh, it was lower among children with Crohn's disease. Let's move to results from COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, in about 38% uh, of uh, children with IBD, according to the children, and 20% uh, of children with IBD, according to the parents, pandemic had a positive impact of their disease control, as well coping with the symptoms of the uh, disease. On the other hand, uh, we can see that about 32% of children uh, from control as well as study group uh, thought that COVID-19 had negative impact on their contact with peers. Now I would like to conclude my presentation. Uh, the quality of life in children with uh, IBD doesn't differ significantly from that of non-affected children except uh, the dimension of school functioning and we can conclude that our patients are treated well and they can have normal lives like their peers. 
uh, in control group, in each dimension of, pets, of PetSQL uh, questionnaire, the parents' rating of their children quality of life is statistically lower from the opinion of children. And we think uh, that this uh, difference in assessment may be due to the uh, parents' lack of insight into their children's life, or maybe uh, the parents of healthy children are more uh, demanding. And apart from emotional functioning in impact-free questionnaire, almost all ratings in children with Crohn's disease are, and children with ulcerative colitis are similar. We are going to uh, continue our work uh, and by expanding both study and control group. And thank you all for your attention. Does any member of the jury have any question? <laughs> it's a very interesting study, uh, of course, and uh, I think that it's very interesting to compare this control group and what was the secret in this control group, for the child from school or...? Um, we, um, carried uh, those questionnaire in several um, different vaccination points. So uh, this was uh, children from a uh, country and also uh, from the town, and uh, they are very uh, viable. Uh, it was a hu 77 children, so it was uh, a huge group, and uh, from 7 to 18 years old. So. Uh, yes, we uh, we asked before uh, giving a questionnaire if I if they are unaffected by any disease. In that case, thank you for your presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, and now let's move to another presentation uh, presented by Magdalena Novak. Uh, retrospective analysis of risk factor and clinical curse of cholelithitis in children. Dear jury and colleagues, Today, I have pleasure to present to you our work, the retrospective analysis of risk factor and clinical course of children with cholelithitis hospitalized at Department of Pediatric Medical University of Silesia in Katowice in 219-221. Cholelithitis is quite rare condition in pediatric population. However, in the recent years, the incidence of this condition has been increasing. Cholelithitis is associated with many risk factors, but in fact, in 30% of patients, the etiology of this condition remains unknown. Most symptoms of cholelithitis are non-specific, such as uh, abdominal pain, sometimes localized in the right upper quadrant, nausea, vomiting, or jaundice. This study aims to identify the risk factor, clinical course, and complication of cholelithitis in pediatric population. Uh, the medical records of 51 children diagnosed with cholelithitis were analyzed. All of the patients was, were hospitalized at the Department of Pediatric, and then the data was statistically analyzed. Our study group consisted of 65% of girls and 35% of boys, aged between 3 months and 17 years. The mean age of patients was 13 years, and according to this graph, Children above the age of 10 were the, most, uh, were the largest group of patients. Now let's start with the result. The patients were divided into three groups. The first group, patient with isolated cholelithitis. The second group, patient with cholelithitis. And the last one, patient with acute pancreatitis. As you can see on the graph, uh, Cholelidocholitis were the most frequent cause of hospitalization in our group. Uh, contrary, isolated cholelithiasis uh, was uh, the less frequent uh, diagnosis. The mean hospitalization times was 10 days. 
And according to this graph, the longest hospitalization time was found in patients with acute pancreatitis. The difference between hospitalization time was at the limit of, st of statistical significance. According to our study, cholelitis appeared for the first time in 75% of patients. If you look on this graph, you will see that the incidence of hospitalization due to cholelitis has been increasing in recent years. Now let's turn to the nutritional status of patient. Uh, what is significant in our study group, there were more than 60% 60, 60 of patients with an excessive level of nutrition. 19 children were obese and 12 of them were overweight. Uh, based on our findings, 98% of children present the symptomatic cause of cholelitis, and abdominal pain, vomiting, and jaundice were the most common symptoms. We have also analyzed the uh, lab parameters uh, per, uh, from the lab test performed at the day of the admission to the hospital. As, as you can see on this graph, uh, the highest level of direct bilirubin, GTP, and ALT uh, were found in patients with cholelitis, and contrary, the lower level of these parameters uh, were presented in the group of patients with isolated cholelitis. Now let's move to the ultrasound examination. It revealed gallstone in 90% of patients, and other common findings were features of cholecystitis, fluid in the abdomen or preval cavity, or features of acute pancreatitis. However, what should be emphasized that in the group of patients with cholecystitis, the gallstone in bile ducts were found in MRI, but not in the ultrasound examination in 65% of patients. Now let's move to the treatment. The, air, the ERCP procedure was performed in 35% of patients. Uh, however, please notice that during this procedure, the number, oh, sorry, uh, the number of successful removal of gallstone was equal with the number of self-removal of gallstones. And now let's turn to the complication. Uh, complications were observed in 65% of patients, and the, common, the most common were cholecystitis, acute pancreatitis, and cholangitis. Uh, we have also analyzed the various number of risk factors of cholecystitis in children population, and in our study group, obesity or overweight and other comorbidities were the most frequent risk factor. However, during the analysis of patient medication, we have observed that the drugs, which are typically related to the cholelitis in children population, were observed in less than 4% of children. Uh, however, the psychiatric drugs, which are not typically related to cholelitis, were taken by almost 18% of children. Uh, to sum up, there is an increasing incidence of cholelitis in pediatric population, so it should be considered in differential diagnosis of abdominal pain, cholestasis, and acute pancreatitis. Female adolescents patients were more often affected, and the most common risk factor were obesity and comorbidities. However, the impact of psychiatric drugs should be investigated, and at least, although the ultrasound examination is the most appropriate imaging study in children with cholelitis, the MRI should be taken into account when the cholelitis is suspected. Thank you for your attention, and please feel free to ask any questions. And thank you for a beautiful presentation. May I have just one technical remark? If you go to your last slides with conclusion, uh, conclusions, there is nothing visible if you put it in such a color. You have to okay. <laughs> make it more, <laughs> more bright. I'm sitting in a first row, so it's okay, but I'm sure that people sitting in the background don't see anything. It looks very nice on a computer screen, 
but you have to consider <laughs> that. Yes, in a comp yeah. computer screen, well, it looks fine, so. Uh, yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> this is something when you put red on a blue. They always yes, say, don't okay. do that, okay? <laughs> Just technical. Okay, now uh, coming to, the, um, to, the, to your uh, real conclusions. Uh, did you find any correlation? Uh, you wrote, could you go one slide uh, behind? Yeah. What were the uh, endocrine disorders, <coughs> I am curious, and, and liver disease? Uh, because many of your children were obese. Th did they have not alcoholic uh, fatty lizard disease? Uh, or uh, what were the endocrine things? You know, mm, because yeah. I'm endocrinologist, okay. that's why I'm interested in that. Yes, uh, non alcoholic fatty and disease were found in some uh, cases. However, Th it there was any any correlation between non-alcoholic fatty disease and hyaluronidiasis, or you didn't examine that? Uh, we didn't examine that because uh, it was uh, this disease was uh, also was only observed in the ultrasound examination, mm. so it was uh, observed by the accident, and uh, the number of patients wasn't uh, so high, so we uh, didn't analyze them. Uh, when it comes to uh, other liver disease, there were some patients with uh, PFIC, PFIC and P Please explain. I don't know and this PAC is, uh, <laughs> uh, is a uh, congenital condition of the liver. Okay. And, and endocrine, you don't remember? What uh, hypothyroidism. Oh, okay. Most often. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I also uh, have one remark. Uh, you uh, must be more carefully when speaking English. Uh, so the topic of your study was holelithiasis, and uh, you pronounced uh, completely other word. Uh, so uh, when you present your uh, work uh, in different uh, situation, you have to uh, just say gallbladder stones, and then it will be clear for everyone. Okay, I'm sorry. It was because of the stress. I guess. Yes, I know that it was the stress. But uh, if you will uh, show your work abroad, you have to remember about that. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Okay, thank you for the presentation. I have one question about the comorbidities from the neuro and psychiatry side. Can you tell us more about it? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, uh, the majority of patients, they're psychiatric patients which suffer from uh, depression, some uh, problems with feeding, anorexia. Mm, there is only two patients with neurological condition with epilepsy. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have one question about these uh, patients um, who recovered uh, without uh, surgery. And uh, do you know if they were treated with any medication or it was just a spontaneous uh, resolution and how long does it take? Uh, okay, it was a spontaneous resolution of gallstone, uh, but because of the symptoms of choledocholitis, this procedure uh, were obligatory in this patient. And the time uh, was, uh, there was a various time because uh, uh, the, when the children uh, were admitted to the hospital and present the uh, signs of choledocholitis, the RCP uh, procedure should be performed as fast as possible. Thank you. I would like to ask you about the oncohematological diseases. I suspect that there was hemolytic anemia? Uh, no. No. Uh, no, no. There was a five patients with oncohematological disorders. Uh, three of them had aspherocytosis, and two of them had uh, leukemia. This is, this is such a situation. Aspherocytosis, yes? Yes, yes. Okay, okay. Typical. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for the discussion. Thank you so much. And now last but definitely not least, uh, Anna Wilk with presentation on the analysis of the level of vitamin D in children with T1D, a retrospective population-based single center study. The floor is yours. Good morning. 
My name is Anna Wilk and today I would like to present a study in which uh, we analyze the vitamin D3 level in the children with type 1 diabetes. In the children, uh, including those with a type 1 diabetes, um, deficiency of the vitamin D3 uh, commonly occurs. Over the last decades, uh, it has become clear that um, vitamin D3 exerts anti-inflammatory and immunomodulatory effects, apart from its well-established role uh, in the uh, regulation of calcium homeostasis and bone metabolism. The aim of our study is the analysis of the vitamins D3 level in the children with type 1 diabetes. We conducted a retrospective study in which 1,148 children took part. All the patients were hospitalized um, in the year of 2021 at the Department of Children's Diabetology and Pediatrics in Upper Silesian Child Health Care Center in Katowice. Uh, we analyzed the entire research group aged 1 to 21 years. Of the children, 55% were boys and 45% were girls. The vitamins D3 levels were in the range um, of 3 to 297.7 nanograms per milliliter. I would like to turn now to the results. Uh, as can you see, the median uh, vitamin D3 level uh, was 23.74 nanograms per milliliter <laughs> with a standard deviation uh, of more than 14. The vitamins deficiency, understood as less than 20 nanograms per milliliter, was found in 34% of the children. What's interesting, we observed uh, a statistically significant uh, difference uh, in the vit vitamins uh, level, uh, depending on gender. In boys, uh, the vitamin D3 level was 24.54 nanograms per milliliter, uh, but in the girls, it was lower, around 23. Then we divided the children into two age groups, from 2 to 10 years old, and 11 to um, 21 years old. Uh, the higher uh, levels of the vitamin D3 uh, were observed in the younger uh, uh, children, and this difference was significantly, uh, signifi uh, statistically significant. Uh, two children were excluded due to compulsory supplementation. This diagram shows that the median uh, of vitamin D3 level um, um, excuse me. Uh, this diagram shows that uh, in the group of uh, younger children, um, the vitamin D3 level was almost 27 nanograms per milliliter, uh, and in the population of um, older children, uh, it was around 22 nanograms per milliliter. Uh, in this slide, you can see uh, that the median uh, of vitamin D3 levels fl fluctuate over the course of the year. Uh, as you can see, uh, the highest uh, level uh, of the vitamin D3, um, over 28 nanograms per milliliter, uh, was observed in, in summer, uh, but the lowest in winter, only around 20. The graph on the slide uh, shows uh, how the values of vitamin D differed in other seasons of the year. Uh, as can you see, the most varied results were obtained in spring, but the, uh, but the least in winter. To sum up, uh, in the children with uh, type 1 diabetes, the deficiency of the vitamin D3 often occurs. Seasons of the year, sex and age may have an impact on the vitamin D3 level. Thank you for your attention. Do you have any questions?
Sorry, is there any question from the jury? So maybe I will start. Congratulations. It was very uh, nice uh, work. I have one question. What was the time of sampling uh, during initial period uh, when the diabetes was recognized or diagnosed or uh, after the follow up? Uh, we knew that the question might come someday, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, actually we don't know. We didn't uh, record the data while mm, collecting those, uh, while collecting. So we don't know how what's the stage of the of the children. If this is newly diagnosed or th these are all the children that come to the outcome and the uh, hospitalized in the department. So they are also newly diagnosed and uh, with longer. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, but I think you have to uh, take into uh, and uh, show um, you have a lot of data. Uh, I ask because uh, I also perform such a work uh, uh, in children uh, on uh, with chronic kidney disease, and uh, when they started uh, with the, the, the disease, um, the level of vitamin D was low. And uh, when they were uh, in conservative treatment, it was really better, even better than in healthy uh, children. So it is worth to uh, compare how it was at the beginning and uh, during the follow-up. Yes, thank, thank you, you very much. And we want to uh, continue our research because it's a huge database, actually, about more than 1,000 people there. So we want to move another data there. Thank you very much. And I wanted to clear, because uh, the title, and we have printed it a little bit different than the title you showed on your first slides. So the study was performed only in diabetic children or? or yes, in, in diabetic children. Uh, okay, were the children supplemented with vitamin D? Excuse me? Were they supplemented? Did they take drugs uh, with of vitamin some D? Some of them did, some of them didn't. We don't know who did and who didn't. Because if you don't know this, it's really difficult to compare, you know, the, the, the level of vitamin D. Actually, all of the children should take the vitamin D, and so... Well, uh, well the, one of the um, conclusions for me is quite obvious, that during the summertime, vitamin is higher. So yes. this is like opening the open door. Uh, sorry to say that, but, but I think you understand it. Yes, I know, I know. And, uh, well, I have to say I'm a little bit critical about this study, and because maybe I should not discuss it, because I'm overall critical about vitamin D. Uh, when I was a child, uh, there was a fashion to take mus intramuscular vitamin D, like two, three thousand per three months or so. Then it was very much criticized, stupid way of, of functioning and so on. Then we came back to very small doses of vitamin D and nobody did break, nobody had any problems with, with vitamin deficiency. Now this is a very uh, much in fashion topic and I think is overestimated because uh, to the lack of vitamin D that are described different things, depression, uh, uh, obesity, whatever you think of, including unwanted pregnancy probably. Yes, so, uh, you know, all uh, population in Poland are almost all is vitamin deficient, uh, which is not true in my opinion, because everything goes according to the, the curve of Gauss, you know, there are some which are deficient, there are some which are normal and some who are over uh, taking the vitamin D, which we have seen in our world. And so you have to really look critically at your study because uh, I am not very much enthusiastic of that. Okay, and I, and I, I think I you really people. have a, a critical view of what you have done, not to be a, just, you know, this shows this and that. The main aim of this, like the, more, uh, the main curve. It's, like. it's a difficult job, I understand, because this is something very much now on the top. And, and uh, 
I am really sorry for you to do that job because <laughs> <laughs> it's very tricky. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you. I completely understand your point, but I would like to highlight that, that the deficiency of the vitamin D can impact on the course of diabetes and can worsen the course of the disease. So that's why we took the point. Yes. You are probably aware that there was one work, uh, one publication published, I think, in Lancet, which is, of course, very respected journal, yes, many, many years ago from Finland, trying to show that taking vitamin D will prevent you from diabetes type 1. I saw uh, this, yes, that, I saw that's this. something paper. absolutely stupid, and it was criticized by many, many other uh, authors, and of course it's being cited, because it's being criticized, right? So it, it has a very high citation index. <laughs> if I can interrupt so, you here, I saw another paper from the Middle East uh, about the same topic, and, uh, and they prove it in a molecular way that it can really impact on the development of diabetes. Not, not the treatment, not in the treatment, but it, it can impact on the, uh, the newly diagnosed, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I am just trying to show you how, how curvy way you are going to follow. <laughs> yes, it's a hard topic, I know, but... <laughs> okay. <laughs> So thank you for the discussion. All right, so all of the submitted papers have already been presented. We congratulate to all of the authors as well as participants of the session. We hope you enjoyed this time and that the exchange of views and observations will contribute to the increase of your medical knowledge. At this point, I would like to ask the president of the jury Eva Małeska Tendera, for a few words to sum up the session. Yes, yes, please. Okay, it was my great pleasure to be here and to listen to all your presentation. And really being, a, truly speaking, some of them on a were on a much higher level than the presentation during several symposia and, and uh, that I have attended, including international ones. The way of presenting your, your research was really fantastic and I can only congratulate all of you. And we all sitting here had problems grading your work. Uh, I wish I could give six to everybody but of course we had to make some differentiation. So please do not feel, uh, uh, we feel sorry if we graded it a little bit lower than six, okay? Well, Michael Schrader put uh, the, the level on the, on the top uh, level with his first presentation. Uh, I'm not gender sensitive, so because he was the only man presenting, I guess. But he really has done fantastic work with fantastic English. So it was very hard for us to be, uh, to grade all the other uh, presentations. But the main thing I want to tell you is that you are the future of the medicine. Uh, doing, uh, um, doing this kind of job, it's not being well paid off. You know that, that doing research does not pay in money, and, but it does pay in satisfaction. And uh, I tell you that because I have been doing this all my life. Now I am finishing my job. Just uh, the next, day, next two days I'm going to be honored with the 50 years of my medical diploma, which you know it's a big uh, feast, so I can judge you from, from many years of my work. And I just want you to keep going this way. It's worth to do that. It gives you a lot of satisfaction, even if it does not give you a lot of money. But this is something that really counts in your life. So big congratulations for, for everybody. And please do not get discouraged and continue what you started to do now. Thank you for for having an honor of being here. It was a, a big, big pleasure for me. Thank you very much. 
Thank you for all these words. At this point, I would like to express the words of thanks to the members of esteemed jury. We truly appreciate your valuable comments, accurate observation, and work on presentation assessment. Dear participants, we would like to cordially invite you to the decoration and closing ceremony of Silesia, International Medical Congress of Silesia 2022, which will be held here on Friday at a quarter 4 p.m. Ladies and gentlemen, session of neonatology and pediatrics comes to an end. On the behalf of Student Scientific Society, I would like to thank you all for participation in the session and wish you a nice day. Now, as we finish, we would like to ask you all, both our esteemed jury as well as the participants, for a group photo to commemorate the session. So, if you could just please, participants, enter the stage.
so let me welcome you to the uh, general uh, to the uh, session of uh, scientific medicine uh, for PhD students uh, in this year's SIMC conference. Uh, so uh, I welcome all the all of the jury members. Uh, I'm glad that you came in numbers this year, and I also welcome most importantly most importantly uh, the participants because you are the core of this conference. Uh, so. Uh, I hope everything is prepared uh, and all of you have uh, uh, sheets of uh, assessment of today's works and I think we can uh, I think we can uh, begin so I uh, ask to come forward to the first uh, participant uh, Miss uh, Alexandra Gwadyś The floor is yours and give me five seconds to run your presentation. So, dear commission, dear colleagues, uh, my name is Alexandra Guadis and I'm a six-year medical student and I'm representing the Department of Cytophysiology, Chair of Histology and Embryology. And I want to present you the results of our research on the efficiency of isolation of human uh, amniotic epithelial cells, uh, which is a collaboration between our, de our department and two departments of uh, gynecology and obstetrics. Something's not working. Uh, placenta is affected by the pregnancy pathologies, and for example, in preterm delivery, uh, the dimensions of the placenta are usually reduced. In gestational hypertension, we obs often observe hypovascularization, and in diabetes, placenta are usually larger, and all of these complications are quite common in pregnant patients. Uh, but I will focus more on the amniotic membrane, and it consists of two layers, and both of them are the source of pluripotent cells. And uh, human amniotic epithelial cells in particular that have a lot of advantages, such as they do not uh, display tumorigenic potential in vivo, uh, they are easy to obtain in a non-invasive way, and they do not uh, raise any ethical concerns. Uh, but of course, uh, we focus on human uh, amniotic epithelial cells because they have a potential clinical application. And here on the left, uh, there is an image from our, our, one of our experiments where they were put intravenously into mice and they were later found in mice lungs. And on the right, I picked some examples from clinical trials where researchers tried to prove their therapeutic potential in bronchopulmonary dysplasia. Uh, but uh, getting back to the placental pathologies, uh, we hypothesized that since the vascularization in abnormal placenta is altered, then the efficiency of isolation of those cells will be lower because the number of cells would be lower and the aim of our study was to determine if it's true. So we compared uh, 38 isolation of, uh, isolations of human amniotic epithelial cells and all of them were from C-sections and they were isolated in the same way. And we compared our parameters of isolation with, uh, with medical records. And we defined the efficiency of the process as a quotient of the number of cells and the weight of the amnion used for isolations. And briefly, the protocol starts with the dissection of the amnion. Then it is uh, purificated and digested in trypsin. And later, we count the cells using flow cytometry. And uh, we culture the cells or preserve. And besides counting the efficiency, we also checked for alter mor altered morphology and we evaluated surface and intracellular markers using flow cytometry. Uh, we distinguish a few groups of uh, patients. First, uh, women who delivered their baby preterm, uh, then those who had hypertension or the fetus was hypotrophic, and mothers of older and younger age. And here are the results of our study. Uh, first, the mean efficiency was 4.5 million of cells per gram of amnion, 
uh, but the uh, standard deviation here is quite large and the same is with the number of cells and the weight of uh, the amine used uh, for isolation. At Jenny the light microscopy, we did not see any differences between studied groups and the control. Uh, and here I put some examples. Here's the uh, younger mother and older mother, a uh, mother with hypotension and with preterm delivery. Uh, also, we did not observe differences in flow cytometry markers, and here is a typical example uh, where uh, the population of cells is negative for mesenchymal markers, CD44, CD19, and CD105, uh, but most of the cells is positive for epithelial uh, cytokeratins, uh, SSEA4, which is a marker of pluripotency, and B7H3, uh, which is an uh, immunomodulator and takes part in the downregulating of immune response response uh, of the mother during pregnancy. Uh, finally, statistical analysis, uh, which revealed that there is no association between the efficiency of isolation and age and uh, medical status of both mother and the child and uh, reproductive history. Uh, none of those variables, uh, none of those results reach statistical significance. So summing up, we did not find any significant difference between the efficiency of isolation of human uh, amniotic epithelial cells from normal and abnormal placenta, but we observed quite large uh, variations and we think it may be a result of individual variability or uh, that we didn't have a group, study group large enough to observe uh, statistical significance. And thank you for your attention and if you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I have one question. Uh, it's uh, usual that the, uh, the person leading the conference asks also, uh, always here. So uh, uh, if you're going to say what's the input uh, of your research in the field of medicine or and, uh, and science in general? Uh, I would say that, uh, like during uh, calculating on the, all those uh, all, all those variables and the fact that we did not uh, see any difference between normal and normal placenta, it leads to the uh, uh, to the conclusion that we can use both normal and abnormal cells for isolation, and we can like do our experiments more efficiently because we have a more a lot more donors possible. Yeah, thank you. So, if there is there any other question? I think we can ask them in Polish or native language as well. Okay, so thank you for the first uh, presentation and we can proceed to thank the you. next one. Thank you too which is uh, Ms. Agnes Bocian and Violetta Rosik. Yeah, of course. Thank you. The floor is yours, and let me uh, just add one rule that I forgot uh, to mention before. Uh, we have seven minutes for a presentation and three minutes for a eventual discussion. Okay. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, present um, uh, the result of my work. My name is Agnes Bocian, I'm a doctoral student and I am uh, also a specialist of endocrinology. Um, and I'd like to present um, the work under the title Leptin Selected Tumor Markers and Metabolic Syndrome Parameters in uh, Pancreatic Neuroendocrine Neoplasm. Uh, at the beginning, I'd like to say a few things about uh, neuroendocrine tumors, uh, which develop from cells exist in the gastrointestinal 
a tract and in the pancreas, described as diffuse endocrine system. Pancreatic neuroendocrine neoplasm, PANNENS, account for 4% of all NENS and for 30% of uh, GEPNET. The prevalence of PANNENS uh, is high and is constantly increasing over last year. Uh, the metabolic syndrome is not a separate uh, disease, but a group of conditions uh, such as obesity, hypertension, hyperglycemia, and dyslipidemia. The MS uh, pathogenesis includes multiple uh, genetic and acquired entities that leads to increased risk of um, developing diabetes and cardiovascular disease. There are many classifications of um, uh, metabolic syndrome. One of them is developed by International Diabetes Federation. And according to uh, IDF definition, for a person to be defined as having the uh, metabolic syndrome, they must have central obesity. And two of uh, the following, like uh, hyper triglyceridemia, uh, the low um, HDL cholesterolemia, um, hypertension, and um, uh, high, low, uh, high level of uh, glucose. Uh, uh, new days, we know that uh, the fat tissues is not only on energy storage, but is uh, also an uh, endocrine, um, uh, 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 endocrine organ and produce lots of uh, hormones like leptin. Uh, traditional leptin role is uh, energy homeostasis, uh, but it takes part in many other processes. Uh, like, and it's in addition function like a neoplastic process supporter in cancers. The leptin overexpression has described in multiple types of cancers, um, uh, such as uh, pancreatic cancer, but the role of leptin in PANNETS uh, was not fully evaluated and understood yet. Um, Carbohydrate antigen and uh, carboembryonic antigen are markers um, useful in the diagnosis and treatment of um, gastrointestinal cancers and pancreatic cancer. And chromogranin A is a non-specific marker for all NANs as well as pan NANs, and it works as a prognostic factor for survival and as a marker for treatment. Uh, the relationship between PANNENS and uh, metabolic um, syndrome is not fully known. It's not so far fully studied. Um, wherever the metabolic syndrome components could be involved in the etiology of PANNENS or could influence their outcomes. The prevalence of PANNENS is uh, constantly increasing over the year. Uh, in parallel with the increasing in, uh, incidence of um, uh, metabolic syndrome. Uh, so the possible relationship should be investigated. Those we search for association between uh, leptin uh, selected tumor markers and metabolic syndrome parameters in pancreatic neuro, uh, neuron neoplasm. Um, so we assess uh, the concentration of leptin, selected tumor markers, metabolic parameters, and anthropetic uh, measurements uh, in a study group consists of one and, um, 106 patients with PANNETS and uh, control group um, consist uh, uh, from uh, 40 healthy volunteers. Uh, the study group was stratified into following subgroups uh, uh, according to BMI, according to um, metabolic syndrome and gender. Exclusion criteria um, were uh, for both uh, groups were lack of un informed consent to participate in the study, pregnancy, lactation, age less than 18, uh, the presence of other cancer disease or kidney or hepatic failure. Uh, the statistical calculation were performed using statistic. Results, um, significantly higher concentration of uh, biomarkers were observed in PANNETS, patient compared to controls. Leptin levels uh, were similar in uh, both groups. Uh, in comparison with a uh, patient with uh, normal BM BMI versus those uh, with BMI uh, high, there was no significant differences of uh, biomarkers, but we observed significantly higher leptin concentration in PANNETS, patient with uh, higher BMI, and only leptin had the capacity for differentiation patient with normal and high BMI, and that is a fair biomarker for PANNETS with elevated BMI. Um, Metabolic syndrome was diagnosed in 25% uh, uh, PANNETS patient, except um, uh, CEI uh, levels. No stati uh, statistically um, significant differences were found in other uh, serum markers. And the, um, the concentration of CEA uh, was uh, statistically uh, uh, significant. Uh, 
Uh, females tend to have uh, higher leptin levels than men. The sex of the Panet's patient did not affect uh, to, the uh, to the concentration of other markers. Uh, the leptin uh, had the capacity uh, for differentiation uh, male from male, uh, female from male of uh, Panet's patient, uh, but it's unfortunately as a poor single biomarker for uh, Panet's female. And in the last steps of study, we assess the correlation between BMI and analyzed variables in all uh, Panet space subjects. And we observed uh, significant association with age, wave, uh, cholesterol, uh, triglycerides, uh, glucose, and leptin level. However, no association were found with other biomarkers. Um, in conclusion, the study reflects the importance of determinate uh, markers. Future research should focus on understanding the impact uh, metabolic disturbances on uh, NANS and accounting for the relationship between uh, NANS and metabolic syndrome, like other uh, malignancies. For uh, what more, as a result of proven role of leptin in cancer neogenesis in the gastro gastrointestinal cancer, um, future research in panets needs to be done. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you. And do we have any questions? Uh, so, again, let me start. Uh, what's the impact of your research in the field of medicine and science? Um, I, um, uh, just searching for the uh, biomarkers and uh, 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 their role in the cancer organisms, I think, is the basic for the understanding the biology of the uh, neuroendocrine tumors to have the benefit for the uh, better treatment, uh, for example. Thank you, and any other questions? Okay, so thank you. Yeah, that's that's uh, for for advice. Uh, so let me ask you another question. Dziękuję bardzo za pytanie. Taką wagę techniczną ja byłam pomysłodawcą tematu pracy. Realizowałam ten tą pracę, robiłam oznaczenia. Natomiast pani doktor Wieleta Rosiek zajęła się analizą statystyczną. No i też razem z panią profesor Koskudłą było jakby nadzorem takim merytorycznym. Thank you. And any other questions? And uh, so. Thank you once again. That's the moment for a bravo. And uh, let's get back in time to Alexander Gwadish. And please uh, fill your presentation with the answer for the question about your input in, the, uh, in your work. Okay, so full, full impact. Uh, okay, so let me uh, introduce the next speaker today. Uh, Miss Julita Zdrada. The floor is yours and I will prepare the slideshow. Dzień dobry, szanowna komisja, szanowni zgromadzeni. Nazywam się Julita Zdrada i reprezentuję Katedrę Podstawowych Nauk Biomedycznych Wydziału Nauk Farmaceutycznych Śląskiego Uniwersytetu Medycznego. I pragnę Państwu dzisiaj zaprezentować pracę dotyczącą hiperspektralnej oceny skóry poddanej terapii IPL. 
IPL to urządzenie, które emituje światło polichromatyczne, niekoherentne i, i rozproszone. Zakres to od 400 do 1200 nanometrów i dzięki temu możemy Możemy leczeniu poddawać e, różne problemy skórne, między innymi e, rumień, e, przebarwienia, trądzik, czy także e, fotoodmładzać. Obrazowanie hiperspektralne to innowacyjna technologia, która, e, dzięki której możemy uzyskiwać pomiary ilościowe na podstawie przeskórnych informacji przestrzennych i widmowych, i widmowych a górno, główną zaletą tego obrazowania jest to, że jest ono nieinwazyjne i pacjent nie musi się do niego specjalnie przygotowywać. W badaniu wzięło udział 20 ochotników ze zdiagnozowanym e, trądzikiem e, o umiarkowanym nasileniu oraz grupa kontrolna 20 osób, które tego trądziku, e, u których tego trądziku nie zdiagnozowano. Wszyscy ochotnicy przeszli serię Wszyscy ochotnicy z trądzikiem przeszli serię czterech zabiegów IPL z tygodniowymi odstępami. Naświetlani byli lampą o zakresie od 515 do 1200 nanometrów, a energia zabiegowa była zwiększana wraz z każdym kolejnym zabiegiem. Ochotnicy, którzy byli poddawani zabiegom, zostali sfotografowani przy użyciu kamery hiperspektralnej z Pekim IQ przed zabiegami oraz tydzień po ostatnim zabiegu. Każde ze zdjęć było w takim samym formacie 512, 512 na 512 pikseli. Wyizolowano 204 zakresy widmowe z, w zakresie od 397 do 1004 nanometrów z rozdzielczością 3 nanometrów. Pierwszy zabieg wykonany był przy użyciu 12 juli energii i krótkiego impulsu. Następnie w zależności od reakcji skóry wykonany był zabieg albo 13 albo 14 dżulami na krótkim impulsie. Trzeci i czwarty zabieg to były dwa przejścia. Trzeci zabieg był wykonany przy użyciu energii 14 juli na krótkim impulsie, a następnie drugie przejście to było 11 juli na długim impulsie i w ten sam sposób był wykonany czwarty zabieg, z tym, że pierwsze przejście było przy 15 julach. Zdjęcie, które Państwo widzicie, obrazuje skórę. Zdjęcie A jest to skóra przed, poddany, przed zabiegami. Oj przed zabiegami, B jest to po serii zabiegów, a C jest to skóra z osoby z grupy kontrolnej. I następnie tutaj wyizolowano z każdej długości fali właśnie te zakresy spektralne. Im zdjęcie jest jaśniejsze, tym reflektancja tej skóry jest wyższa. Wykazaliśmy, że niższą reflektancję w porównaniu do grupy kontrolnej ma skóra trądzikowa, jednak po serii zabiegowej także nie, po tych czterech zabiegach także ta skóra nie, nie jest aż tak blisko tej grupy kontrolnej. Wyizolowaliśmy trzy punkty tej najniższej reflektancji i jest to długość fali 430, 549 oraz 588 nanometrów i tutaj w tym zakresie porównaliśmy, porównaliśmy te różnice statystycznie. Wykazaliśmy, że w porównaniu skóry przed zabiegami oraz kontroli na tych trzech długościach fali istnieje istotność statystyczna na poziomie P mniejszym od 0,05. Następnie w dwóch zakresach fali od 549 do 588 nanometrów ta istotność występuje między skórą niepoddaną zabiegami oraz po zabiegach. I następnie w tym samym zakresie wykazano istotną statystycznie różnicę pomiędzy skórą kontrolną a tą poddaną, zabiega, poddaną terapii. Dzięki obrazowaniu hiperspektralnemu jesteśmy w stanie sklasyfikować tą falę o najniższej reflektancji i która obserwuje dane promieniowanie najbardziej. Dzięki temu jesteśmy w stanie precyzyjnie określić długość fali, którą, e, którą jesteśmy w stanie e, efektywnie przeprowadzić terapię, czy wybrać długość fali lasera, czy też e, filtra odcinającego IPL, tak aby też zminimalizować e, efekty uboczne. 
Następnie niższa reflektancja w zakresie od 400 do 599 nanometrów jest spowodowana akumulacją chromoforów, które absorbują, absorbują, absorbują większą część promieniowania. Jest to spowodowane tym, że w trądziku jednak stan zapalny oraz udział melanocytów, czy także wzrost mikrocyrkulacji, który spowodowany jest zwiększoną angiogenezą oraz udział Cutibacterium acnes, które produkują porfiryny, zwiększa, zwiększa ilość tych chromoforów w skórze chorej. Interesującym, interesującym zjawiskiem jest to, że powyżej 600 nanometrów ta reflektancja wzrasta i utrzymuje się na poziomie od 0,8 do 0,9. Jest to spowodowane tym, że tkanki, tkanki w zakresie od 650 mniej więcej do 1200, jest to takie okienko terapeutyczne, gdzie ta długość fali jest w stanie penetrować głęboko, ale nie jest w stanie tkanka pochłaniać jej, absorbować jej dużo. Dzięki temu też jesteśmy w stanie jeżeli chodzi o obrazowanie hiperspektralne, jesteśmy w stanie też ocenić właściwości danej tkanki. Dziękuję bardzo. A, wkład własny. Wkład własny to może Tak, jakby powiem. Pani uzupełniła wkład własny. <laughs> Tak naprawdę, jeżeli chodzi o zabiegi, zabiegi były wykonywane w klinice przez, przez lekarza dermatologa. My tylko obserwowałyśmy i obrazowałyśmy tych pacjentów. Wszystkie obliczenia były wykonane przez nas. Okay, dziękuję. No i zadam też swoje standardowe pytanie. Jak Pani ocenia wkład tej pracy w obecną wiedzę medyczną? Myślę, że jest to bardzo ważna część, dlatego że trochę te zabiegi laserowe wykonuje się na ślepo według gdzieś tam ustalonych, ustalonych pików absorpcji konkretnych chromoforów, melaniny czy hemoglobiny, a tutaj jesteśmy w stanie bardzo mocno zindywidualizować te zabiegi, więc wykonując najpierw obrazowanie kamerą hiperspektralną jesteśmy w stanie precyzyjnie wyznaczyć te wartości, gdzie pochłanianie tego światła jest po prostu największe. Dobrze, dziękuję. I czy są jeszcze jakieś pytania? Ja podejdę z mikrofonem. Musimy chyba jednak to uzupełnić. W swoich badaniach pani podała wartość energii. Jaki był czas ekspozycji? Bo to też może mieć znaczenie, jeżeli w krótkim czasie jest dosyć duża porcja energii. To, były, to są takie pulsy pikosekundowe tak naprawdę, więc jeżeli chodzi o samo wykonanie zabiegu, to przykłada się głowicę, puszcza się impuls, to jest impuls pikosekundowy, więc tak naprawdę miejsce przy miejscu wykonuje się ten zabieg na krótkim impulsie. Dziękuję bardzo. Dziękuję. Czy jeszcze jakieś pytania? Dobrze, w takim razie dziękuję. I... Dziękuję bardzo. W takim razie ponowne brawa. Uh, and let me get back in English. Uh, so uh, the next speaker, Ms. Katarzyna Szałapska Rompała. Honorable quality, uh, dear colleagues, my name is Katarzyna szałapska rompała uh, and I represent the cathedra of pharmacognosy and phytochemistry of Silesian Medical University. Today I'm honored to present you the result of my work, uh, which is entitled Effect of Magnovol on Oxidative Stress Parameters in the Testes of Rats with Experimental Diabetes. Uh, diabetes is a chronic metabolic disease uh, which is uh, characterized by hyperglycemia and results uh, in a production of uh, 
uh, reactive oxygen species and free oxygen radicals, uh, which is increased. Uh, it leads to the occurrence of oxidative stress, which can be defined as an imbalance between the um, ability of the body to neutralize uh, these uh, uh, radical uh, oxygen radical species by uh, endogenous uh, metabolic uh, action of the toxication mechanisms and uh, increased production of these uh, radical detectors. Long lasting oxidative stress uh, can um, cause uh, macrovascular and microvascular complications, which are the pathogenesis of male reproductive system disorders, such as erectile dysfunction, death of, um, uh, death of uh, reproduct reproduction cells, uh, histopathological changes in the testes, impaired sperm parameters, or finally infertility. Magnolol is a natural lignan can, which can be found in the bark of magnolia and it possesses inter alia antioxidant, antidiabetic, cardiovascular, neuroprotective uh, and antidiabetic properties. So uh, the aim of the study was to evaluate uh, the effect of magnolol on the oxidative stress parameters in the testes of rats uh, with uh, induced uh, by high fi diet and streptozotoxin type 2 diabetes. The experiment was conducted on a group of male major Wister rats, uh, and the rats were divided into four groups. C, control non-diabetic rats, DM, uh, control uh, type 2 diabetic rats, uh, MAC5 and MAC25, uh, type 2 diabetic rats uh, which received orally magnolol, respectively at the doses of 5 and 25 milligram per kilogram of the body. Uh, diabetes uh, was caused by a single uh, injection of streptozotoxin uh, and the long-term uh, high-fi diet, which was given to the rats. Um, the effect of uh, magnolol on the oxidative stress parameters uh, was uh, estimated uh, by using spectrophotometrical methods, by uh, analyzing uh, the content of its biochemical markers in the testes of rats. Uh, the level of glucose, soluble protein, malonaldehyde, and uh, advanced oxidation protein products, AOPP, uh, as well as the activity of uh, mm, glutathione peroxidase, GPX, uh, catalase, CAT, and uh, so superoxide dismutase, SOD, uh, were measured spectrophotometrically uh, in isolated and homogenized tests. Uh, the weight of uh, the rats and the weight of uh, testes were also recorded. Uh, this slide so shows the effect of magnolol on the body weight changes in the rats with type 2 diabetes over the duration of the experiment, as well as the weight of the, of, uh, the testes and uh, testicular weight to body weight ratio. Uh, it is uh, obtained that uh, diabetes uh, caused a statistically significant increase in the uh, testicular weight to body weight ratio and only the administration of magnolol at the dose of 5 mg per kilogram of body weight caused a statistically significant increase. The next slide uh, presents the effect of magnolol on the blood glucose uh, levels changes uh, in the rats with type 2 diabetes over the duration of the experiment, as well as the uh, level of glucose and soluble protein in the testes of rats. Uh, it was observed that diabetes caused a statistical, statistically significant decrease in the soluble protein level and the administration of magnolol at the doses of 5 and 25 mg per kilogram caused a statistically significant increase in this parameter. Here we can observe uh, the mm, uh, here we can observe that diabetes caused a statistically significant increase uh, in the activity of SOD and GPX, and uh, in contrary, uh, administration of magnolol at both doses caused a statistically significant decrease. Uh, in the activity of uh, SOD and GPX. What's more, administration of magnolol at the dose of 5 mg per kilogram caused a statistically significant increase in SAT activity. Uh, 
Last but not least, uh, diabetes caused a statistically significant increase in uh, AOPP level and administration of Magnolo at both doses and statistically significantly reversed this trend. Other parameters that uh, was mentioned before remained unaffected. Uh, the obtained results may indicate a positive effect of Magnolol at both doses uh, on the parameters of oxidative stress in the testes of rats with uh, induced diabetes, experimentally induced diabetes. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, it would be my pleasure to answer any questions if you want to uh, know a little bit more about my experiment. Thank you. So the first uh, question goes, uh, what's your input uh, in this work? Okay, so I was involved from the very beginning of the experiment. Uh, we started from breeding rats. It was with the help of the university. Uh, so my role was to take care of them, to feed them, to uh, generally take, taking care. Uh, then with the help of my supervisors, uh, the magnolol was administrated to the rats. And then there was a preparation when, where the rats were killed. Of course, it was uh, doing by the people who had uh, uh, proper, uh, let's say, um, rights to do this. So I just observed. Uh, but then uh, when the um, testes were um, isolated, uh, I took them, I homogenized them, and then I was doing all the measurements. So the glucose, soluble protein, uh, antioxidative enzyme, and uh, AOPP and MDA was uh, was be, was be, they were um, uh, I was measured them uh, by the commercial kits and then uh, with the help of my supervisors uh, I do the statistic and uh, I presented these results on today's conference. Okay, thank you. And uh, what's the possible uh, impact on the knowledge about medicine and science? Okay, so type 2 diabetes uh, is the kind of a disease that we try to um, actually find uh, an alternative uh, cure to uh, help people to live with this. Of course, uh, it is not as severe as the type 1, but uh, we can make people's uh, life easier. And I think that uh, searching for a new alternative drugs can be uh, very vital for this kind of a people. What's more, uh, Magnolo uh, has some other, uh, let's say, um, uh, articles that uh, has shown that it has this anti-diabetic anti or antioxidant properties. So now we have uh, checked it out on the rats, so uh, in vivo experiment, and we hope that our results can help other people uh, to develop maybe the clinical uh, trials and to check it out on the living human being. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? So thank you for your presentation. Thank you, and I would like to thank you, my supervisors, uh, with whom I actually made this presentation. Thank you so much. And our next speaker, Mateusz Maszczyk. Szanowna Komisjo, Szanowni Państwo, ja nazywam się Mateusz Maszczyk, jestem doktorantem Szkoły Doktorskiej SUM. Zaprezentuję Państwu pracę wykonaną na Katedrze i Zakładzie Chemii i z Leków SUM pod tytułem The Evaluation of Chemosensitizing Properties of Neobavai Isoflavone Towards Itoposite in Anaplastic Astrocytoma. Na wstępie opowiem Państwu o tematyce związaną z prezentowaną pracą, następnie przejdę do celu, następnie omówię materiały i metody, jakie zostały wykorzystane przy realizacji pracy oraz zaprezentuję Państwu wyniki. Głównym celem chemioterapii jest eliminacja komórek nowotworowych i najczęściej dochodzi do tego w wyniku indukcji apoptozy, 
do której dochodzi w wyniku aktywacji przeróżnych mechanizmów, które ją indukują i to jest wykorzystywane w farmakoterapii przeciwnowotworowej, ale niestety bardzo często się zdarza tak, że pojawia się oporność na leczenie i to jest związane z szeregiem różnego rodzaju mechanizmów, przez które efektywność terapii jest niska. W niniejszej pracy skupiliśmy się na gwiazdziaku anaplastycznym, który jest zaliczany do glejaków o wysokim stopniu złośliwości i charakteryzuje się słabym rokowaniem oraz między innymi tym, że może pojawić się oporność na leczenie. W poszukiwaniu nowych strategii leczenia przedmiotem badań są nowe substancje o potencjalnym działaniu przeciwnowotworowym oraz leki, które są już stosowane w praktyce onkologicznej. Przykładem pierwszego związku jest neobawa izoflawon, który jest związkiem pochodzenia naturalnego, którego prawdopodobny mechanizm działania związany jest z inhibicją polimerazy DNA, natomiast drugą substancją jest etopozyt, który jest lekiem stosowanym powszechnie w leczeniu różnego rodzaju nowotworów i jest to lek z grupy inhibitorów topoizomeraz. Istnieje również kolejna strategia, która jakby łączy te dwie wcześniejsze, o których wspomniałem. Po polsku można ją określić jako hemosensytyzację i ona zakłada wykorzystanie nietoksycznego związku, który uwrażliwia komórki nowotworowe względem leku. Celem niniejszej pracy była ocena wpływu neobawa izoflawonu, na aktywność etopozydu, a konkretniej na przeżywalność, na zdolność do indukcji apoptozy, zmiany w potencjale błon mitochondrialnych oraz cyklu komórkowego w ludzkim gwiazdziaku anaplastycznym w komórkach linii SW1783. W trakcie badań zostały zastosowane standardowe warunki hodowli komórkowej. Do oceny przeżywalności wykorzystano test kolorymetryczny WST1, który opiera się na aktywności dehydrogenaz mitochondrialnych, czemu towarzyszy zmiana barwy. Przeżywalność została określona w komórkach hodowanych przez 48 godzin w szerokich zakresach stężeń substancji badanych i na godzinę przed zakończeniem inkubacji został dodany odczynnik, a następnie absorbancja została zmierzona za pomocą czytnika mikropłytek. W badaniach wykorzystano również szereg technik cytometrii obrazowej, między innymi detekcję komórek apoptotycznych z wykorzystaniem znakowanej fluorescencyjnie aneksyny piątej. Została przeprowadzona ocena zmian w błonie mitochondriów z wykorzystaniem sondy fluorescencyjnej JC1 oraz została poddana analizie, został poddany analizie cykl komórkowy w odfalonych komórkach na podstawie różnej zawartości DNA w poszczególnych fazach cyklu. Przechodząc do wyników, przeżywalność w szerokich zakresach stężeń neobawa izoflawonu i etopozydu została określona w celu dobrania odpowiedniego stężenia do skojarzenia neobawa izoflawonu i etopozydu. W przypadku etopozydu wybrano stężenie, w którym była najniższa istotna statystycznie przeżywalność, znaczy najniższe stężenie, inaczej powiedziałem, najniższe stężenie, w którym była istotna statystycznie przeżywalność, natomiast w przypadku neobawa izoflawonu wybrano stężenie 25 mikromoli. W połączeniu komórki, które były właśnie hodowane w połączeniu neobawa izoflawonu i etopozydu zauważono spadek, istotny statystycznie spadek przeżywalności w stosunku do samej, samego leku. Podobnie w tej grupie, która była hodowana z kojarzeniem etopozydu i neobawa izoflawonu, zaobserwowano istotnie statystycznie zwiększenie sub subpopulacji komórek apoptotycznych o blisko 1 trzecią w stosunku do samego etopozydu. Podobnie również w tej grupie zaobserwowano przyrost subpopulacji komórek charakteryzujących się przyrostem 
charakteryzujących się niskim potencjałem błon mitochondrialnych o blisko 3 razy w stosunku do samego leku. Natomiast w, w przypadku cyklu komórkowego w tej grupie, która była hodowana z kojarzeniem etopozydu i neobawa izoflawonu zaobserwowano zmniejszenie subpopulacji komórek będących w fazie S na rzecz faz G1. Podsumowując, neobawa izoflawon w połączeniu z neotopozydem spowodował istotnie statystycznie zmniejszenie przeżywalności komórek SW1783. Neobawa izoflawon zwiększył efekt etopozydu względem indukcji apoptozy w komórkach, prawdopodobnie przez ścieżkę wewnątrzpochodną, co zostało właśnie zaobserwowane, w, znaczy to, co można wywnioskować z wyników z oceny zmian w potencjale błonów mitochondrialnych. Połączenie neobawa izoflawon etopozyt spowodowało zmniejszenie subpopulacji w fazie S. No i prawdopodobnie ten, te właściwości neobawa izoflawonu mogą prawdopodobnie, mają po prostu potencjał wspiera, taki wspar, wsparcie leczenia gwiazdzieka anaplastycznego opartego na etopozydzie. Dziękuję i zapraszam do dyskusji. Dziękuję. I jakby mógł Pan ocenić swój wkład własny? No to od, w sumie od samego początku do końca, czyli pomysł, wykonanie oraz analiza wyników, analiza statystyczna. I czy mamy jakieś pytania do tej pracy? działają na komórki. Czy pokusił się Pan o określenie tego wpływu synergistycznego? Znaczy... Na przykład w obrębie wykonywania jakichś izobologramów, czy na przykład taką analizę, czy uteraleja, czy jakieś inne? Znaczy bardziej nie skąd, ta, bo na pewno przypuszczam, że tutaj synergizm nie zachodzi, tylko bardziej działanie potencjalizujące, bo sam neobawa izoflawon nie działa w ogóle w żaden sposób w tym stężeniu na komórki, a w połączeniu już właśnie powoduje... Bo warto byłoby to uwzględnić ewentualnie później przy dalszej jakiejś mm -hmm. tak pracy, bardzo często w publikacjach później o to pytają. Jeszcze drugie mam pytanie. Ta struktura tego izoflawonu jest podobna do estradiolu. Czy tutaj widziałby Pan możliwość z takiego działania właśnie jako fitoestrogen? Są faktycznie takie badania, zostały przeprowadzone i jeżeli dobrze pamiętam, on działa na obie izoformy receptoru tego estrogenowego. Czyli no, myślę, że bardziej tutaj ma znaczenie Bo Wtedy musielibyśmy określić jeszcze te receptory ewentualnie. Mhm, rozumiem, badaniu. ale myślę, że tutaj bardziej, większe znaczenie ma no i inne ścieżki. Tak, dziękuję. Sygnalizacyjne. Dziękuję. Czy jeszcze jakieś pytania? Dobrze, w takim razie e, dziękuję i zapraszam e, następną. I tutaj jest moment na zejście w brawach. I zapraszam następną prezentującą panią Agnieszkę Dziurek. Esteemed committee, dear participants, my name is Agnieszka Wiurek. I'm a PhD candidate in the Department of Anesthesia in our University Clinical Center. And I would like to present you today the results of my research connected with coagulopathies, especially dilutional coagulopathies, and the associations between the functional coagulation parameters and what we call conventional coagulation testing. Because Ta pierwsza? Okay. 
because we need to remember that fluids are drugs and the way we administer them to our patients have some consequences. There is still no universal recommendations connected with the kinds, the types of fluids and what they include uh, that we administer to the patients, especially during the initial phase of the rapid uh, fluid resuscitation in situations such as massive bleeding. Uh, connected with the uh, risk of uh, hemovolemic shock. So we have balanced crystalloids, we have synthetic colloids, and they are devoid of the clotting factors. So while administering the sometimes enormous volumes of the fluids intravenously, we may induce dilutional coagulopathy or we may exacerbate the existing dilutional coagulopath the coagulopathies that may be found in our patients. And we can diagnose it different, in different ways uh, with what we call conventional coagulation tests, so PT, APTT, platelet count, fibrinogen concentrations, or we can do it with viscoelastic point of care testing which is much more quicker, 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 which gives us the results after initial five up to 10 minutes and we already know what to do and what our patient lacks. Should we order uh, freshly frozen plasma? Should we order platelet concentrations? And we are not going in blindly. So the aim of this research was to evaluate what is the effect of the intravenous fluids that we give, depending on if we are administering balanced crystalloids or synthetic colloids in a randomized study on the healthy volunteers. And uh, this is the summary of the protocol of the study. It was a prospective crossover randomized study with 25 uh, healthy, so with no known previous coagulopathies, volunteers. They were administered uh, 20 milliliters per kilogram of clear uh, of, of chosen fluid, and the blood samples were collected immediately before the infusion and immediately after the infusion, with coagulation parameters examined and co collected and analyzed. And with the rotational thromboelastometry parameters, we focused on three assays connected with intrinsic coagulation pathway, extrinsic coagulation pathway, and the assay connected specifically to fibrinogen concentrations. And we have some parameters connected with clotting time and the quality of the clot, because that's also one of the advantages of the functional viscoelastic testing. We know how, uh, w what's the clot strength, how well the clot is accumulating. We can actually examine the initiation, amplification, and propagation phase of coagulation. This is how the equipment looks, and these are the thermograms, so the graphical uh, the pre the presentation of the acquired results. The study group demographics, and so what's important here is that the baseline characteristics for all the coagulation parameters before infusion of both fluids were not significantly different uh, in the statistic uh, in the statistical analysis analysis so the effects of the infusion and the effects of the of the uh, dilution and coagulopathies that we observed resulted just from the infusion itself because we tried we tried we eliminated every possible uh, confounder based on the exclusion criteria for the study group recruitment and what we could observe is that the dilution was substantial in, ter in terms of both fluids and when, compared, uh, when we compared the fluids themselves. So the effect of the synthetic colloid was much more pronounced and statistically significant than that of the uh, synthetic crystalloid, uh, balanced crystalloid. And uh, it was visible in the conventional coagulation testing and in the ROTEM analysis. So all the parameters connected, especially with, again, clot quality, qu clot form formation, clot strength and firmness, were statistically significantly influenced by the dilution. So the quality of the clot decreased. 
the parameters connected with fibrinolysis were not affected by, by, by either of the fluids. So in terms of the lysis, of the deterioration of the clotting process, there was no uh, clinically visible effect. So what can we take from this study? What's the impact of this study? We need to be conscious about the dosage of the drugs that are different intravenous fluids. Because even with the doses of the fluids regarded safe in a clinical practice by various guidelines connected with septic, septic shock, uh, massive bleeding protocols, uh, and uh, similar sit uh, clinical situations, we can induce coagulopathy or we can aggravate the previously existed uh, coagulation disorders. However, points go to uh, balanced crystalloids that cost m less of the visible uh, and investigable uh, infusion-induced coagulopathy than the infusion of the synthet synthetic colloid that was the gelatin solution. Thank you for attention. Uh, thank you for the presentation. And are there any questions? Okay, so uh, please tell us what's, what was your input in this work? Well, I was responsible for the study group recruitment and I personally performed all the rotational thromboelastometry uh, examinations. So I sampled the blood and uh, did all the physical work connected <laughs> with the, the, the pipetting of the blood samples. Because on this model of, of the Rotem device, uh, it's still manual. There are some newer ones, of course, but they are more expensive. So uh, we were able to get what we could, but it, it works great. Uh, uh, and uh, well, I, uh, mm, I was also responsible for analyzing the data. Uh, the conventional coagulation testing was performed by our uh, cooperation with Clinical Central Laboratory. Uh, thank you. Uh, still no questions. Okay, so Agnieszka is not leaving us yet. Uh, she also prepared another presentation and she will present it now. So. Okay, uh, so those two uh, studies are a part of the same bigger uh, research and the second part uh, focuses more on the methods themselves. So in general, functional point of care testing should allow us for the quick diagnosis and determination of the best course of treatment, especially in medical emergencies such as massive bleeding. However, uh, clinicians are still required to order all of the conventional coagulation testing, which takes a lot of time, because all the lab tests, even if, uh, if ordered as urgent, uh, needs uh, time for the blood sample transportation and needs time for the blood sample processing. So we get results in like 30, 45, sometimes even up to 60 minutes after the blood sample collection during we during which we act uh, blindly. We uh, start with some massive transfusion protocols and we transfuse all these alloproteins that most of which our patient potentially do not need. So there is still a room for the research uh, con uh, connected with the point of care devices that should be uh, trusted enough for us to base our binding clinical decisions on those results that we can acquire in a matter of minutes. So in this part of the research, we focused on the level of correlation between those two methods, the conventional coagulation tests and the rotten parameters. And we hypothesized that the correlations will be strong enough no matter what type of fluid we chose for the initial phase of fluid resuscitation. Because it's part of the same study, the protocol looks exactly the same. So again, it's crossover randomized prospective study with our 
volunteers that were devoid of any potential confounding effects uh, and factors based on the exclusion criteria. And again, we mostly want to focus on the rotem parameters, which allow us for the determination of the quality of the clot formation process of the coagulation as a whole. And here we can see that the percentage of hemodilution was substantially bigger, again, in the colloid uh, part, uh, uh, after the colloid infusion, which we can see as the hematocrit drop before and after infusion of both types of fluids. And in the next uh, tables, mm, we pr I present the coagulation coefficients for the rotten parameters and their respective equivalent of the conventional coagulation tests. And all of the correlations were verified in multivariate analysis by mul multiple regression. However, due to time constrictions, I didn't want to show the data here to not overflow the presentation. And you can see that most of the parameters have moderate to strong correlation with their rotem equivalents. I marked the strongest correlations with these yellow circles. And again, the correlation, the, uh, the level of association goes for both the parameters connected with the clotting time, so the time needed for the initial fibrin conglomerates to form, and the clot quality connected with the fibrinogen concentration, platelet concentration, clotting factor concentration, the amplitudes, the firmness, the dynamics of the clot formation. The strongest correlation were visible for the rotem assay connected with fibrinogen and fibrinogen concentration, which is also relevant because fibrinogen nowadays in literature is considered the best parameter for coagulation process diagnosis. So, with such results, we can conclude that yes, we should be able to trust, we should be able to base our decisions on those point of care testing without the worry that later on we could be potentially put into consequences because we didn't wait for the conventional laboratory results. We, did, we, needed, we, 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 we bought our patients the time. Then we can verify whatever we want for how long we want, but we acted on the initial parameters, initial results, results that we could acquire as quickly, as clinically possible, no matter the kind of the fluids that we chose. So no matter if we decided that we are going through with the balanced crystalloid or that we need some volume expanders that are colloids while waiting for the blood products to arrive. And again, thank you for attention. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, pity I wasn't able to uh, participate in those uh, research due to my bad gra uh, blood type. Uh, so uh, again, what was your input in this work? So again, it's, it, it's all a part of the big research project that took uh, a couple of months, so I basically lived in my hospital during those months because I needed to collect the samples and uh, wait for the rotem analysis, because the full rotem analysis takes, takes 60 minutes. But clinically, even with the first parameters like amplitude at five minutes, like clotting time, like clot formation time, we already know enough to act. If we run all three assays, the intem assay, the extem assay, the fiptem assay, we in a matter of minutes, we can know uh, we, we know what we need to order. So we can call for fibrinogen concentrate, for freshly frozen plasma, for some PCCs, so prothrombin complex concentrates, and it really helps uh, minimizing the the volume of blood and blood products, blood derived products that we administer our patients. So I ho I'm hoping that maybe the results of this study will potentially influence uh, further future recommendations that allow for more determined recommendations for their uh, clinical practical use. So uh, that was my second question, what was the, uh, the practical uh, 
practical outcome. So, uh, are there any other questions? I I see not. Uh, so thank you once again and give Agnieszka a big applause. Thank you very um, much. And let me introduce our next speaker, uh, which is uh, Karina Stempin. The floor is yours. I will prepare the slideshow. Dzień dobry. Wysoka Komisja, Szanowni Państwo, nazywam się Karolina Stępień i chciałabym zaprezentować wyniki, które są częścią mojej pracy doktorskiej, czyli analiza białek macierzy z nocz komórkowej pozyskanych z tętniaka, ze ściany tętniaka aorty brzusznej. Na wstępnie chciałabym troszeczkę przybliżyć tą patogenezę tętniaka aorty brzusznej i tak naprawdę jakiego typu jest to schorzenie. W pierwszej kolejności lokalizacja aorty brzusznej jest umiejscowiona poniżej ujścia tętnic nerkowych. Sama patogeneza tętniaka aorty brzusznej jest niezwykle skomplikowanym molekularnym procesem. Tutaj wiele czynników ryzyka ma wpływ na to, jakie czynniki molekularne, jakie procesy molekularne będą nam tutaj odgrywały kluczową rolę. Bez wątpienia jest to choroba niebezpieczna, ponieważ jest chorobą bezobjawową, jest wykrywana w momencie diagnostyki chorób innych chorób, czyli przypadkowo na przykład poprzez USG jamy brzusznej. Często też jest wykrywana w momencie już pęknięcia, więc to znacząco obniża też jakość życia pacjentów również po operacji. Pierwszymi takimi głównymi czynnikami ryzyka oczywiście są czynniki genetyczne, jak i też płeć i wiek, ponieważ ta choroba występuje głównie u mężczyzn powyżej 65 roku życia. I te czynniki ryzyka będą nam uaktywniały procesy molekularne, takie jak właśnie apoptoza, apoptoza komórek w ścianie aorty, czy też właśnie stres oksydacyjny, czy też proces zapalny. Kolejne ważne czynniki ryzyka, czyli palenie tytoniu, różne infekcje, czy też właśnie wysokie ciśnienie krwi, będą aktywowały kolejne procesy molekularne, chociażby też aktywację proteak, które będą nam degradowały białka macierzy komórkowej, głównie kolagen i elastyna, które są no, kluczowymi białkami w macierzy i będą odpowiadały za utrzymanie struktury tej ściany orty i utrzymywanie też odpieranie ciśnienia też krwi. W mojej pracy skupiłam się głównie na analizie kolagenu i elastyny. Kolagenu typu pierwszego, trzeciego i elastyny. Chciałabym również pokazać, jak tak naprawdę takie wycinki wyglądały po zabiegu operacyjnym. Proszę zobaczyć, tutaj mamy trzy wycinki od trzech różnych pacjentów. 70, 70 lat, 71 i 83. Proszę zwrócić uwagę, że właściwie tutaj nawet w obrębie e, jednej grupy wiekowej te tętniaki się niezmiernie e, różnią, e, co tak naprawdę może nas też posiłkować do powiedzenia takiego stwierdzenia, że tak naprawdę każdy tętniak może być inny, mieć inne podłoże molekularne, e, co jest niezwykle e, trudne do też zweryfikowania i, i, i zbadania. Pokazuje to też, że jest to materiał heterogenny, no i troszeczkę ciężko się na nim pracowało. Warto tutaj jeszcze chciałabym dodać, że mamy zaznaczoną niecią chirurgiczną, część dogłowową tętniaka, co jakby nam pomaga w ustaleniu lokalizacji tego tętniaka aorty brzusznej, czy części dogłowowej. Głównymi moimi zadaniami była ocena, znaczy standaryzacja metod ekstrakcji białek macierzy i oczywiście analiza kolagenu typu pierwszego, trzeciego oraz elastyny. Nie chciałabym tutaj też ominąć moich pacjentów. Do badań zakwalifikowaliśmy 19 pacjentów. Sześciu zostało poddanych ekstrakcji białek, natomiast 13 zostało po prostu ocena, została zrobiona ocena ekspresji genów. Nie byli to przypadkowi pacjenci, tutaj były dość mocne kryteria włączenia i wykluczenia. Ci pacjenci nie mogli mieć w swojej rodzinie tętnia korty brzusznej, miażdżyty czy też właśnie różnych rekonstrukcji naczyń, chociażby też właśnie też cukrzycy. Głównym moim materiałem były właśnie wycinki tętniaków aorty brzusznej. Metodyka była troszeczkę skomplikowana, więc chciałabym na wstępie ją mocno wytłumaczyć. W pierwszej kolejności tętniaki zostały podzielone na trzy odcinki, czyli pierwszy, drugi i trzeci. I z tych odcinków zostało wyizolowane RNA w celu właśnie oceny ekspresji genów, następnie w celu jakby 
e, izolacji białek macierzy, e, każdy z tych odcinków został rozwarstwiony, czyli na warstwę zewnętrzną, środkową i wewnętrzną ściany aorty, więc z każdego tak naprawdę tętniaka miałam 9 próbek, z których ekstrahowałam e, białka. W pierwszej kolejności, żeby w ogóle podjąć tej ekstrakcji i oceny ekspresji, no, należało jednak zwizualizować te białka i sprawdzić, czy w ogóle e, białka, których szukamy, e, występują. Więc pierwszym krokiem było oczywiście barwienie hematoksyliną eozyną, następnie Syriusz Red w celu identyfikacji włókien kolagenowych i eozyny, czyli tutaj włókna elastynowe. Te badania wyszły pozytywnie, te włókna pojawiły się, więc to jakby z skutkowało tym, że zastosowałam specyficzne przeciwciała do konkretnych już łańcuchów alfa kolagenu typu pierwszego, kolagenu typu trzeciego i oczywiście elastyny. Zanim natomiast jeszcze przeszłam do, ekspresji, do, ocen, do izolacji białek z macierzy, wykonaliśmy ekspresję genów z poszczególnych odcinków ściany tętniaka orty dłużej bez rozwarstwienia. Tutaj również chciałabym dodać, że do głowowy odcinek oczywiście jest zaznaczony nicią chirurgiczną, ale nad jest, założyliśmy, że jest to najmniej zmieniona ściana aorty, więc ona nam służyła jako kontroli, ale tylko i wyłącznie, jeżeli mówimy o ekspresji genów, ponieważ była to wystarczająca ilość materiału do izolacji RNA, natomiast nie była to wystarczająca ilość materiału do izolacji białek. No i przejdę teraz sobie do izolacji już białek metodami biochemicznymi. Proszę zobaczyć, że tych metod było sporo, natomiast tylko dwie jakby pozwoliły na izolację właśnie białek macierzy, czyli kolagenu i kolagenu typu pierwszego i trzeciego. Niestety tymi metodami nie udało się wyizolować elastyny. Pierwszy wynik, czyli właśnie zobrazowanie tego, jak ta ściana tętniaka orty brzusznej w ogóle wygląda, hematoksylina, eozyna, po prostu zwizualizowanie tego, jak ta ściana aorty wygląda. Gwiazdką zaznaczyłam światło naczynia, warstwa wewnętrzna, środkowa i zewnętrzna ściany aorty. Czerwień, odcinek pierwszy, odcinek drugi, odcinek trzeci ściany tętniaka. Czerwień Syriusza, czyli oczywiście tutaj bardzo ładnie wybarwiły się nam włókna kolagenowe zaznaczone żółtą strzałką, eozyna, czyli włókna elastynowe zaznaczone niebieską strzałką. Chciałabym też dodać, że tutaj udało się akurat bardzo ładnie wybarwić też skrzeplinę w warstwie wewnętrznej, co pokazuje nam, jak bardzo mocno jest uszkodzona ta ściana aorty. Też nie, nie było łatwo wykonanie tych preparatów ze względu na to, że po prostu jest bardzo zdegradowana ta tkanka. Taka skrzepina bardzo mocno osłabia nam ścianę naczynia, odsłania nam kolageny, błonę podstawną i jeszcze bardziej naraża na mechaniczne uszkodzenie tych białek, co jakby skutkuje oczywiście degradacją ściany aorty. Tutaj jest wynik już specyficznych detekcji specyficznych łańcuchów alfa kolagonu typu pierwszego i trzeciego. I tak w pierwszym odcinku jakby tutaj nie widzimy zbytnio dużych zmian, natomiast w odcinku drugim i trzecim już te zmiany się pojawiają. Jest dość istotne to, że tutaj łańcuch alfa kolagonu typu pierwszego i łańcuch alfa 2 kolagonu typu pierwszego, w tych warstwach jest go alfa 2 znacznie więcej niż alfa 1, a w warunkach fizjologicznych jest zupełnie Dobrze. Ocena ekspresji genów, tutaj również mamy pewną, pewne zaburzenie, więc widzimy, że tutaj znaczące różnice mamy między pierwszym a drugim odcinek ściany, ściany tętniaka orty brzusznej. W tym wypadku dla kolagenu kol 1 a 2 genu mamy różnicę między kontrolą a odcinkiem pierwszym, między pierwszym a drugim i pierwszym a trzecim. Między drugim a pozostałymi nie mamy żadnych istotnych różnic statystycznie. Dla kolagenu typu trzeciego genu te różnice są praktycznie takie same jak dla kolagenu typu drugiego i dla elastyny, dla genu elastyny ekspresja jest znacząca statystycznie między pierwszym a drugim odcinkiem. Ekspresja białek, ocena izolacji białek, tutaj widzimy dwie metody, oczywiście pięciomolowy chlorek łajdyny jest lepszą metodą izolacji, Obydwie metody pozwoliły nam izolację tych łańcuchów kolagenu typu pierwszego i trzeciego, natomiast e, pięciomolowy chlorodek łajniny jest metodą wydajniejszą. E, dobrze. I w, e, podsumowanie, czyli e, udało się wybarwić włókna kolagenowe i elastynowe we wszystkich warstwach i odcinkach świętynia karty brzusznej. Mamy znaczące różnice w ekspresji e, genów. E, no i oczywiście, jeżeli chodzi o metodę biochemiczną, chlorowodor eguantyny jest lepszą metodą, e, wydajniejszą. Natomiast jeżeli co łączy te dwie metody, to to, że po prostu tego łańcucha alfa-1 kolagenu typu pierwszego e, było i trzeciego znacznie mniej w każdej z odcinków tętniaka aorty brzusznej. E, oczywiście zgoda Komisji Bioetycznej. E, dziękuję. Yeah, that was a, quite a stretch. Uh, so, uh, are there any questions?
Mm, unfortunately, no. So let me ask you, uh, what was your input? Generalnie y, izolacja białek, izolacja RNA, y, ocena y, również y, ilościowatych białek, y, SDS page, western bloty, a to było moim zadaniem. No i na koniec y, obrabianie wyników, czyli metody statystyczne, żeby zebrać y, te wyniki w całość. Y, chciałabym też dodać, że tutaj ta grupa badawcza nie jest dość, y, dość duża, więc y, chciałabym też właśnie w przyszłości móc wyizolować moje białka na większej grupie badanej, bo na pewno te wyniki byłyby um, lepsze. Okej, okay. dziękuję bardzo i nagroźmy brawami. I zapraszam następnego preleg pre prelegenta, pana Mateusza Bruncela. Szanowny jury, szanowni państwo, nazywam się Mateusz Broncel i reprezentuję Katedrę i Zakład Biofizyki Wydziału Nauk Farmaceutycznych w Sosnowcu. Moja prezentacja dzisiaj będzie się skupiała na wstępnej ocenie kompatybilności potencjalnie nowych leków z grupy inhibitorów konwertazy angiotensyny typu pierwszego z wybranymi substancjami pomocniczymi, które są używane w stałych postaciach leków. Inhibitory konwertazy angiotensyny, ich mechanizm działania polega na, jak sama nazwa wskazuje, inhibicji konwertazy angiotensyny, która to jest odpowiedzialna za y, zmianę angiotensyny pierwszej, przekształcenie do angiotensyny drugiej, której to zadaniem jest y, obkurczanie naczyń krwionośnych, co wprost przekłada się do wzrostu ciśnienia krwi. Zastosowanie inhibitorów angiotensyny powoduje więc spadek ciśnienia krwi, co przekłada się na zastosowanie kliniczne, ponieważ te leki są używane w chorobach nasercowych, między innymi w nadciśnieniu. Jednak najnowsze doniesienia wskazują na to, że można grupy z tych leków wykorzystać również w chorobach nowotworowych, jak również w przypadku chorób neurodegeneracyjnych, np. w chorobie Alzheimera, ze względu na to, że posiadają bardzo duży potencjał do wymiatania wolnych rodników jak również posiadają względnie dobrą penetrację bariery krew-mózg. Minusem tych leków niewątpliwym jest ich stosunkowa niska stabilność, co jest związane z występowaniem w ich strukturze grup estrowych. I dlatego właśnie poszukuje się takich substancji pomocniczych, które by tą trwałość tych leków zwiększały. Substancje pomocnicze, przede wszystkim ich główną rolą jest nadanie masy tabletce, poprawa jej wyglądu, smaku, takich wizualnych. Dodatkowo stabilizacja struktury leku, jednak nie mogą one wykazywać żadnego efektu terapeutycznego. Mają być obecne wraz z lekiem w formie podania tabletki. Jednak na tym się ich rola kończy. Ewentualnie mogą stabilizować strukturę tego leku, ale nie mogą wywierać żadnych właściwości farmakologicznych. W eksperymencie można do badania kompatybilności leków z substancjami pomocniczymi można wykorzystywać metody termiczne i nietermiczne. Do metod nietermicznych stosujemy takie techniki jak HPLC, FTIR, czy wykorzystanie promieniowania rentgena. Natomiast w przypadku technik termicznych wykorzystujemy DSC, termografimetrię i DTA. W eksperymencie użyłem term, metody termicznej w oparciu o metody termografimetryczne i celem pracy była ocena kompatybilności nowo syntetyzowanych lek potencjalnych leków z grupy inhibitorów konwertazy angiotensyny pierwszej z wybranymi substancjami pomocniczymi. Wybrane zostały dwie spośród wielu próbek 
które roboczo nazywają się AJ-71 i AJ-74. Są to zupełnie nowo syntetyzowane leki, które jeszcze nie mają swoich, swoich nazw handlowych, swoich nazw klinicznych. Zostały one wyprodukowane, zostały one syntetyzowane w współpracy z Poznańskim Uniwersytetem Medycznym. Ich struktura wewnętrzna dodatkowo została potwierdzona poprzez analizę za pomocą spektroskopii NMR, a wykorzystane substancje pomocnicze to były glukoza, laktoza, celuloza mikrokrystaliczna, hitozan, skrobia i stearynian magnezu. Próbki wyznaczono oczywiście termogramy czystych substancji, zarówno pomocniczych, jak i substancji aktywnych oraz wykonano mieszaniny w stosunku 1 do 1 substancji badanych z, z substancjami pomocniczymi. W moździerzu zostały wymieszane, a następnie wykonano analizę termografimetryczną. Jest to metoda o tyle wygodna, że potrzebujemy bardzo małej ilości próbki, bo już nam wystarczy 10 mg. Następnie próbkę umieszczono w tyglu pomiarowym wykonanym z tlenku glinu. Natomiast cała, cały proces analizy termografimetrycznej przebiegał w atmosferze gazu obojętnego, jakim był ciekły azot. Przy tempie ogrzewania próbki 10 kelwinów na minutę, a zakres stosowanych temperatur mieścił się od 35 do 600 stopni Celsjusza. Dodatkowo wykonano analizy kolorymetryczne wybranych próbek w układzie CLAP, gdzie parametr L określał jasność próbki, parametr A udział barwy zielonej i czerwonej i parametr B określający udział barwy niebieskiej i żółtej. Na podstawie tych parametrów został wyznaczony parametr delta E, którego wzrost świadczy o zmianie koloru próbki oraz parametr PI, który świadczy o brązowieniu. Tutaj na slajdzie przedstawione zostały termogramy czystych substancji AJ-71 i AJ-74. Dekompozycja obu substancji badanych przebiegała jednostopniowo z temperaturami topnienia 81,6 stopnia Celsjusza i 116,5 stopnia Celsjusza. Obie reakcje były endotermiczne. I następnie tutaj przedstawię Państwu wyniki termografimetryczne badanych substancji kolejno z, każdym, dobra, z każdą substancją pomocniczą, z glukozą, laktozą, celulozą mikrokrystaliczną, hitozanem i skrobią i starenianem magnezu. Co możemy zauważyć? W przypadku każdej z substancji pik odpowiadający za dekompozycję substancji badanej był przesunięty, czy to w stronę temperatury niższej czy wyższej, jak również były zmienione temperatury meltingu. Świadczy to o tym, że zachodzi jakaś reakcja pomiędzy substancją badaną a substancją pomocniczą, co wprost wyklucza je z dalszego stosowania w formie klinicznej. W przypadku próbki AJ-71 może to być odpowiedzialne w przypadku zastosowania jako substancji pomocniczych cukrów za reakcję Maillarda. W przypadku próbki 74 również następowało to przesunięcie piku odpowiedzialnego za dekompozycję substancji badanej. Jednak tutaj bardziej doszukujemy się wpływu wiązań wodorowych. Dodatkowo wykonano analizy kolorymetryczne badanych substancji. W przypadku próbki AJ-71 potwierdziło się to, co powiedziałem Państwu wcześniej, zachodzi najprawdopodobniej reakcja Maillarda. Możemy to zauważyć wprost, patrząc na parametr B, który świadczy o udziału barwie żółtej, jak również na parametr delta E, który świadczy o zmianie zabarwienia próbki oraz wzroście parametrowi brązowienia. Przechodząc do podsumowania. Zarówno próbka testowa AJ-71, jak i AJ-74 nie wykazała niestety kompatybilności z badanymi substancjami pomocniczymi. Dodatkowo w przypadku próbki 71 zidentyfikowano występowanie reakcji Maillarda. 
niekompatybilność substancji badanych substancjami pomocniczymi no, wyklucza je z dalszego stosowania, jednak trzeba tutaj pamiętać, że dalej poszukujemy tych leków i nawet niewielka modyfikacja chemiczna może przyczynić się do tego, że w końcu wstrzelimy się w tą konkretną i będzie można ją stosować w takiej stabilnej formie. Dziękuję Państwu za uwagę. Dziękuję za prezentację. Czy mamy jakieś pytania? W takim razie, Panie Mateusze, jakby Pan ocenił wkład własny w tą pracę? Jeśli chodzi o wkład własny, to tak. Pomysł na wykonanie badania oraz wszystkie pomiary zostały wykonane przeze mnie własnoręcznie, za wyjątkiem syntezy badanych substancji. Zostały one syntetyzowane w, we współpracy z Poznańskim Uniwersytetem Medycznym oraz przez ten uniwersytet zostały jakby potwierdzona struktura wewnętrzna tych substancji za pomocą spektroskopii NMR. Dobrze, dziękuję bardzo. E, I w takim razie nagroźmy Pana Matusza Brawami e, i zapraszam e, następną prelegentkę, Panią Agnieszkę Kula. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am looking forward to talking to you about the expression of CD276, VTCN1, and HHLA2, members of the B7 family in colorectal cancer. At first, let me introduce myself. I am Agnieszka Kula, and I am a PhD student at Medical University of Silesia. Chyba coś nie działa. To jest gra. No tak. Dobra. Ok, so uh, in this photo you can see my research group, which is composed of Miriam Davidowicz and Sylwia Mielcarska. And I'd like to add that our project is supported by ministerial grant. This is the plan of my presentation. And let me start with introduction part. I'm sure that you know that colorectal cancer is the third most common cancer and the second cause of cancer-related deaths in the world. Immunotherapy is one of the novel and very pro promising uh, alternatives for cancer treatment and is mainly based on the blockade of immune checkpoints. Unfortunately, colorectal cancer does not benefit from immunotherapy as much as we would like, and current immunotherapies based on PDL1 blockade are effective in only 15% of colorectal cancer patients with microsatellite instability tumors. As you can see, searching for new immune checkpoints is crucial to improving colorectal cancer immunotherapies. And that's why me and my research group decided to study B7 immune checkpoints family, which is composed of CD276, VTCN1, and HHLA2. How looked our aim of study? First aim was to assess CD276, VTCN1, and HHLA2 expression in colorectal cancer in relation to microsatellite instability status. And second aim was to assess expression of investigated molecules in relation to histopathological parameters like microvessel density, budding, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, and TNM scale. Now I'd like to present you our material and methods. 84 patients diagnosed with colorectal cancer were enrolled in the study. In our study, we used tissue samples derived from formally fixed paraffin embedded tissue blocks. 
To assess CD276, VTCN1, HHLA2, CD8 expression and microsatellite instability status, we used immunohistochemistry staining. MVD, budding and tumor infiltrating lymphocytes were assessed using a light microscope and the histopathological evaluation was performed by two independent pathologists. Moving to the next point, let's focus on the characteristics of the study group. I'd like to bring your attention on the following graphs. 60% of patients enrolled in our study uh, had T3 tumors, 21 had T2, 17 had T4, and there were only 2% of patients diagnosed with T1 tumor. Nearly 50% of patients it had involved nodes and 11 had metastasis. More than 80% of tumors were G2 in grading scale. And finally, I'd like to show you our results. We assessed uh, CD276, VTCN1 and HHLA2 in tumors. Taking into account CD276 expression, there were 35% of positive cases. This percentage was higher for VTCN1. There were more than 70% of positive uh, of uh, tumors positive for VTCN1 staining. And for HHLA2, we observed the highest expression. More than 98% of tumors were positive for HHLA2 staining. The expression of CD276 and HHLA2 were independent on microsatellite status, while VTCN1 was more frequent in microsatellite stable cases. The expression of CD276 was positively related to expression of VTCN1 and also to the number of CD8 cells. Moreover, HHLA2 expression was negatively related to N parameter. To sum up, in our study, we proved that expression of CD276 and HHLA2 were independent on microsatellite status, while VTCN1 expression was more frequent in microsatellite stable cases. In our study, we observed the significant overexpression of HHLA2 in tumors, and the expression of CD276 was significantly associated with expression of VTCN1 and with number of CD8 cells, and moreover, the expression of HHLA2 was negatively related to N parameter. To the end, I'd like to add that our study provides valuable insight into the role of immune checkpoints in colorectal cancer. Uh, in our study, our investigated molecules are upregulated in colorectal cancer and are associated, associated with histopathological parameters of patients. Further analysis of CD276, VTCN1 and HHLA2 may result in the development of new effective immunotherapy for colorectal cancer. And that brings us to the end. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions? So uh, please tell us uh, what was your part doing uh, this research? Mm -hmm. My contribution uh, to this research, uh, first of all, was to... Uh, I was responsible for uh, the general uh, project and the general, general uh, idea of this project. Uh, I was re responsible for the selection of a research group, for the selection of methodology, uh, and also for the data uh, analysis. Uh, mm, and uh, I was also uh, responsible for, um, for, for obtaining uh, financial support for this work, uh, because I, as I said before, uh, 
our work uh, our work uh, was supported by ministerial grant and this project won uh, the major award in a um, really uh, nice uh, competition organized by minister Ministry of Science, students' clubs uh, make uh, innovations, and it was uh, about uh, 70,000 zlatych, and, and it was my contribution to this work. That's pretty contribution. Uh, still no questions from the jury or other participants? Okay, so that would be all. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. And uh, bravo, yes. Thank you once again. And our next speaker, Isabella Ovsianka. And the shout out for uh, Anna Dolipska. Is she with us? I'm still, still missing your slideshow. Uh, so the floor is yours. Give me a sec for a slideshow. So good afternoon, uh, my name is Isabella Ovsianka and I'm PhD student from Jagiellonia University Medical College. Um, okay, uh, yes. And I'm glad to present you my research, which is entitled SARS-CoV-2 antibody levels according to vaccination status in health co-workers in University Hospital in Kraków, Poland. Uh, so the aim of the study uh, was to assess the level of antibodies against SARS-CoV-2 uh, among health co-workers from hosp University Hospital uh, before and after vaccination with mRNA vaccines, depending on the previous COVID-19 exposure. Mm, and we invited to our study uh, nurses, paramedics, doctors, administrative staff, healthcare technicians, and uh, last year medical students. Um, we divided our study into the two parts. Uh, first, uh, in January 2021, uh, when we asked uh, our participants to complete the survey, which uh, included uh, questions about sociodemographic characteristic and a previous SARS-CoV-2 infection. Um, at the same time, uh, we um, collected blood samples from each participant uh, in order to perform antibody tests using uh, the electrochemiluminescence technique. Uh, and then in June 2021, we, uh, our participants were also, uh, also asked to complete the second survey, uh, which included questions also about sociodemographic characteristics and uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection after the enrollment and about the vaccination. Uh, as well as in January, we um, collected blood samples uh, in order to perform antibody tests using the same technique. Uh, in January, we enrolled 1,484 1, health co-workers. Unfortunately, only from 676 received uh, both surveys and uh, two blood samples, so only that group were analyzed. And we divided them uh, into the two groups, vaccinated and vaccinated group, and uh, then split them into four uh, groups, uh, depending on the result of antibody test in January. And uh, now let's move to the uh, results of the study. <coughs> so first, uh, in over 41% of participants uh, had a positive antibody test result uh, in January, and moreover, 60% of them were not aware of the previous infection. And as you can see on the table, there were no statistically significant differences in vaccination status <coughs> according to uh, sex, age, educational level, profession, uh, or work experience. However, uh, we observed differences in antibody levels, uh, uh, for example, according to age. For pairwise comparison, we used post hoc tests with Bonferroni correction, and they showed that um, group with um, uh, the, the, the youngest group, so up to 30 years old, had uh, statistically significant higher antibody levels than each other uh, age group. A similar situation with course of COVID. So uh, participants who reported uh, asymptomatic uh, infection uh, had higher antibody levels than uh, healthcare workers who reported severe COVID-19. 
And last thing here, the side effects after vaccination. So uh, participants who had a systemic uh, side effects after vaccination, for example, fever or fatigue, uh, had higher antibody levels uh, in June than um, healthcare workers who didn't report any side effects. And last, uh, last, uh, last slide, uh, I would like to show you that, uh, which showed that um, group uh, with, uh, vaccinated group with a positive antibodies test result in January had almost 60, uh, 30 times higher antibody levels in June, so five months after vaccination, than uh, a group with also positive antibody test result in January um, who didn't get a vaccine. And to sum up, uh, uh, our study showed that uh, the vaccination is uh, 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 is effective because um, uh, uh, the, uh, it showed that uh, antibody levels five months after vaccination among participants with a positive antibody test result uh, than unvaccinated participants also with a positive uh, test result. Uh, so there is a difference. And uh, secondly, participants under 30 years old had uh, higher antibody levels in June than older, older healthcare workers. Sorry. Oh. Uh, and last, uh, that healthcare workers with asymptomatic COVID-19 had over four times higher antibody levels than healthcare workers who had a severe uh, COVID-19. And that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions? Okay, so uh, let me ask you one. Uh, Come on, contribution, yes. What was your contribution? Uh, so uh, with uh, stu also two students, we prepared all the database because a lot of surveys and well, also coordinated uh, work with uh, labora hospital laboratory where the uh, antibody tests were performed and also with uh, Professor Paz, who helped us with a statistic. Uh, yes, and that's all. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. That's the time for applause then. Uh, <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, in the meantime, we get through the first part and uh, quite get a bite from the last one, the second part of today's uh, session. Uh, so, uh, let me ask uh, next speaker, uh, Anna Dolipska. Which is not present. Uh, I, I didn't get information from her uh, regarding a, regarding a, a remote uh, presentation. Uh, I will try to check with her. And uh, so the next one on the list is uh, Patricia Przebieradło. who as well oh, maybe we have some the te technician store or uh, video, so I believe somebody will uh, join us shortly. Yeah, so uh, let me introduce uh, remotely Anna Dolipska, our next speaker with number, uh, with number 12. We cannot hear uh, any audio if there is any. Nie słyszymy. Niestety nie mamy, nie mamy audio. Nie wiem, czy to jest po naszej stronie. Nie widzę też pana, czy pan mi... Niestety nie słyszymy panią. Proszę spróbować, na dole jest ikona mikrofonu i proszę sprawdzić, czy jest możliwość wybrania innego mikrofonu. Mm. 
Współczuję Pani, to jest niepotrzebny stres, ale wierzę, że zaraz rozwiążemy te, te problemy. Ja proponuję, może przejdziemy do następnej stacjonarnej osoby. Co komisja na to? Tutaj damy, damy Pani Annie chwilę na rozwiązanie tego problemu, jakieś kilkanaście minut. Pani się zgadza, dobrze. I rozumiem, że jury wyraża też zgodę na tą zmianę. W takim razie proponuję, wiem, że Pani Wiktoria Odżywałek jest z nami dzisiaj. Jest to numer 14, czyli powinno to być na dole strony, żebyśmy się nie pomylili w trakcie oceny. A wierzymy, że Pani Anna za sekundę opanuje i dołączy do nas w wirtualnej rzeczywistości tak jak należy to wykonać. I oddaję głos, a ja potrzebuję sekundki na uruchomienie prezentacji. Dzień dobry, szanowna komisja, dzień dobry wszystkim zgromadzonym. Nazywam się Wiktoria Odżywołek i reprezentuję Katedrę i Zakład Podstawowych Nauk Biomedycznych Śląskiego Uniwersytetu Medycznego w Katowicach i chciałam dzisiaj przybliżyć Państwu nasze badania na temat efektu fototerapii UVB u pacjentów chorych na łuszczyce na reflektancję kierunkową skóry. To ja może już zacznę. Będę kontynuować. Łuszczyca jest chorobą o podłożu zapalnym, jest chorobą autoimmunologiczną, która manifestuje się występowaniem na ciele brunatnych, czerwonych grudek pokrytych srebrną łuską. I jedną z metod terapii łuszczycy jest fototerapia właśnie. Celem naszego badania było e, sprawdzenie efektu, e, jaki daje nam e, fototerapia UVB, wąskopasmowa fototerapia, e, na skórę zarówno zmienioną łuszczycowo, jak i tą niepokrytą łuską e, u pacjentów z łuszczycą na kierunkową reflektancję skóry, a także e, zaproponowanie nowej metody pomiaru e, tej reflektancji, dlatego że e, obecnie nie istnieje metoda e, i nie była wykorzystywana żadna metoda, która w sposób e, powtarzalny, w sposób szybki, bezpieczny dla pacjenta, e, bezinwazyjny i w sposób, który zapewniałby nam powtarzalność pomiarów, byłaby w stanie e, być metodą e, użytą do tego typu badań. E, I z tego względu posłużyłyśmy się wykorzystaniem e, reflektometru. Jest to sprzęt, e, który jest bardzo często wykorzystywany w przemyśle kosmicznym. E, I on e, sprawdza się do tych badań z tego względu, że e, w świetny sposób odwzorowuje e, właśnie e, promieniowanie słoneczne, zarówno pod względem kąta jego padania, jak i pod względem długości fali, a także pod względem powierzchownej gęstości energii, jak i jego kolejnym plusem jest stosunkowo duża średnica portu pomiarowego, co przekłada się na to, że minimalizujemy tym samym ryzyko wystąpienia błędów pomiarowych. W badaniu wzięło udział 48 pacjentów, którzy zostali poddani 20 naświetlaniom, a my dokonywaliśmy pomiarów z wykorzystaniem reflektometrów przed rozpoczęciem terapii po 10, a także po 20 naświetlaniach. 
Kryteriami włączenia do badania był wiek powyżej 18 roku życia, wyrażenie świadomej zgody na badanie, obecność zmian uszczycowych na ciele, a także fototyp drugi i trzeci według skali Fitzpatricka. A najbardziej istotnym kryterium wyłączenia z badania było stosowanie środków przeciwuszczycowych w okresie trzech miesięcy przed rozpoczęciem terapii światłem UV. Analiza statystyczna została wykonana w programie Statystyka 13.3 i została wykonana tutaj Anowa Friedmana. I teraz przechodząc do, do wyników, mogą Państwo zaobserwować, że w przypadku długości fali w zakresie 335 do 380 nanometrów spada nam reflektancja zarówno skóry zmienionej łuszczycowo, jak i skóry niezmienionej, co przekłada się na to, że w przebiegu terapii dochodzi do ścieńczenia warstwy rogowej, czyli też do ścieńczenia łuski, więc widzimy, że terapia przynosi skuteczne efekty. Następnie w przedziale od 400 do 540 nanometrów również reflektancja spada, jednak tutaj w odróżnieniu od slajdu powyższego możemy zaobserwować, że skóra, która jest niezmieniona chorobowo, wykazuje wyższą reflektancję od skóry zmienionej łuszczycowo. W przypadku zakresu długości fali 480 do 600 nanometrów, tutaj chciałabym pokazać cały slajd, w, w, troszkę niżej, tak, e, dokładnie tutaj. E, tutaj e, jest to zakres, w którym e, mieszczą się maksima absorpcji dla melaniny i dla hemoglobiny. I co ciekawe, tutaj również ta reflektancja spada e, w przypadku skóry zmienionej łuszczycowo. E, co jest e, o tyle ciekawe, e, że pomimo tego, że e, leczenie przynosi dobre rezultaty, jeśli chodzi o właśnie ścieńczenie e, tej łuski e, i redukcję stanu zapalnego, to widzimy, że w, w, że w tym przypadku światło w żaden sposób nie oddziaływuje na naczynia krwionośne, które w przypadku łuszczycy, skóry łuszczycowej są poskręcane, drzewiaste, wykazują patologię względem naczyń w skórze zdrowej. Więc tutaj możemy założyć, że Dobrym rozwiązaniem byłoby e, na przykład zastosowanie terapii łączonej, czyli po e, wykonaniu naświetlań e, fototerapią UVB można by było włączyć na przykład leczenie laserowe, które pozwoliłoby nam zamknąć e, obecne zmiany naczyniowe i e, tym samym być może wydłużyć okres remisji. Natomiast jak Państwo mogą tutaj zaobserwować, jeśli chodzi o skórę niezmienioną łuszczycowo, ta reflektancja również nam spada podczas terapii, co wiąże się z tym, że w skórze powstaje więcej barwnika melaniny, więc tutaj moglibyśmy rozważyć zastosowanie w przyszłości jakiejś fototerapii, potencjalnej fotoprotekcji tej skóry niezmienionej łuszczycowo. I tutaj już w kolejnych zakresach długości fali również ta tendencja jest spadkowa zarówno dla skóry zmienionej chorobowo łuszczycowo, jak i dla skóry zdrowej w przypadku bliskiej, jak i dalekiej podczerwieni. Przechodząc do wniosków, zaobserwowano różnice w reflektancji, statystycznie istotne różnice w reflektancji kierunkowej skóry zmienionej łuszczycowo, jak i skóry niezmienionej. W zależności od długości, od długości fali skóra wykazuje różne, różne wartości reflektancji i w przebiegu fototerapii w przebiegu fototerapii doszło do zmian właśnie w reflektancji skóry zarówno tej niezmienionej łuszczycowo, jak i w przypadku skóry zmienionej łuszczycowo. I wykorzystanie reflektometru pozwala nam właśnie na pomiar reflektancji skóry w przebiegu takich, w przebiegu takich terapii jak fototerapia światłem UVB. Bardzo dziękuję. Bardzo dziękuję za wystąpienie. Czy są jakieś pytania? 
Dobrze. I tutaj proszę o wskazanie elementów które, w pracy, które nie zostały wykonane przez Panią. Całość badań, jeśli chodzi o obrazowanie skóry, analizę statystyczną była wykonana przez nas, natomiast nie miałyśmy żadnego wpływu na prowadzoną terapię, ona była prowadzona przez lekarza dermatologa, więc tutaj jeśli chodzi o terapię nie, natomiast cała reszta badawcza, jeśli chodzi o i pomysł i wykonanie badań, to już jest to w całości nasz wkład. Dobrze, dziękuję bardzo. Dziękuję bardzo. E, skontaktowałem się z panią, e, z panią Anną i nie mam jeszcze sygnału, że wszystko działa po jej stronie, więc może przejdziemy do kolejnej pracy, e, numer 15. I tutaj e, to jest praca, przepraszam, pana Z, e, Zygmunta Gofrona. I e, czy jest z nami pani Patrycja Przebieradło? Pominęliśmy numer 13 ale nie mam ani prezentacji, ani żadnego kontaktu. Dobrze, w takim razie procedujemy na razie stacjonarnie i za chwilę wierzę, że rozwiążemy ten problem. Także zapraszam pana Zygmunta. Okay, to begin, uh, good morning, my name is Zygmunt Gofron. I would like to welcome the Nobel Committee and all attendants of International Medical Congress of Silesia. Today uh, I would like to present the results of our work in the Department of Medical Microbiology under supervision of Professor Gajan Martirosian. Uh, the subject of our presentation is Clostridium SPP antibiotic susceptibility, uh, profile of uh, uh, genetic phenotypes and spore prevalence in hospital environment. Uh, I divided our presentation into four parts. First, I would like to introduce you to the topic of Clostridioides difficile. Uh, then I will uh, present the aim of methodology of our study. Uh, and uh, I will end our presentation with uh, results and to sum up, present some conclusion. In the end, I hope I will be able to answer your question. So. Uh, to begin with, uh, to, to begin our presentation, I would like to state that Clostridioides difficile is the main cause of antibiotic-associated uh, diarrhea, and among other causes are uh, other uh, bacteria of uh, Clostridioides genu, for example, Clostridium perfringens. Those are bacteria produce uh, vegetative forms called spores, which are resistant to many uh, biochemical and uh, physical factors, for example, alcohol-based disinfectants, uh, and uh, ultraviolet. Mm, in the hospital environment, among uh, popular methods, uh, there are none of uh, methods that ensures detection of spores. We only detect the uh, uh, normal bacteria, not spores. Uh, if it comes to epidemiology in Poland, the data are not only uh, disturbing, but even alerting. As you see, in 2020, there were uh, 10,000 causes of Clostridium difficile in Poland. Uh, this year, there's uh, more than uh, 21,000 uh, cases. It means that the increase was more than 100%. We have our own hypothesis uh, why uh, to explain the above phenomenon, but due to the lack of time, I will be able to answer uh, it in the discussion time or afterwards uh, after the session. Uh, if it comes to aim of our study, we wanted to detect the presence of Clostridium SPP spores in hospital environment and to detect their antibiotic susceptibility and a genetic profile of the obtained isolates. To do so, we used the special medium called Sediv Banana Broth. Uh, the whole methodology is presented in the picture below. First, we had to take environmental samples from the hospital environment, and then inoculate them to sedative banana broth. Uh, after that, we have to reculture the positive broths for a selective media, for example, sedative and claw. After that, we could uh, perform further steps with uh, obtained strains. It was biochemical added identification, antibiotic uh, resistant testing, and molecular studies. 
uh, first of all, we had to take those swabs. It was the easiest part. Uh, we had to uh, obtain, uh, inoculate them in the broths, and uh, the positive broths are easy to distinguish because it changes color from red to yellow. As you see in the picture, it's it's really uh, uh, it's really easy to distinguish if the broth is positive or negative. Uh, in the picture, you can see the positive and the negative control, and the obtain samples. After that, the um, isolates were identified with VTEC2 Compact. It's a device used for identification of the bacteria. And, uh, and the strains were recultured in anaerobic conditions uh, in 37 degrees for two days, uh, which enables us to detect uh, 16 out, uh, 15 out of 40 uh, samples, out of which uh, seven were Clostridium perfringens, uh, three were Clostridium barati and uh, Clostridium uh, difficile each, and two were Clostridium paraputrificans. Uh, if it comes to antibiotic resistance, we performed tests according to UCAST 2021 uh, with the use of tests for 10 antibiotics. Uh, and if it comes to uh, genetic profile, we had to perform the uh, genetic examination for toxins of Clostridium difficile and Clostridium perfringens of obtained strains. We used the QAMP uh, kit to uh, Mm, to extract the DNA, and then for amplification, we used the M multiplex PCR method. Uh, then the results were mm, uh, presented with the electrophoresis with bromide uh, uh, etit, and uh, presented with the Syngen G-Box. If it comes to results, as you can see in the picture, the high prevalence of uh, the uh, strains uh, resistant to clindamycin, rifampicin were obtained. Uh, those data are not that uh, alarming because the metronidazole and the vancomycin uh, strains, uh, all of the strains were vancomycin and metronidazole sensitive. What is uh, curious, the Clostridium perfringens strains had a uh, high uh, percentage of resistant strains and it's uh, alerting because the benzylopenicillin is the antibiotic used for uh, Clostridium perfringens treatment. Uh, if it comes to genetic profile, uh, two Clostridium uh, uh, difficile strains uh, had all toxins, although one of, in, uh, of them was RMB uh, gene positive and the other was RMB uh, negative, and the other uh, possessed only uh, B toxin. If it comes to Clostridium perfringens, all strains possessed only alpha toxin. Uh, to conclude, uh, we were able to obtain the high prevalence of Clostridium perfringens strains, which is um, a little bit curious because the possibility to produce uh, spores by Clostridium perfringens is uh, diminished to other uh, bacteria of the Clostridium genu. Um, also, uh, the isolation of the toxinogenic and antibiotic resistant strains of Clostridium perfringens uh, demonstrates uh, one of the spreading way of those strains in the hospital environment uh, bet between patients and the medical staff hands. And uh, we do believe that for medical and epidemiological, epidemiological surveillance, we should use the appropriate media, such as sedif banana broth, uh, because they are the only way uh, which enables us to detect uh, not only the active bacteria, but also the spores. Uh, so, thank you for your attention. I hope you will have some questions I will be able to ask. Uh, answer, sorry. Okay, so are there any uh, questions from jury or other participants? Okay, so let me ask you the question. Uh, what uh, was your part in this research? Okay, and the question. Uh, the, uh, uh, we uh, performed all of the uh, steps of our study. We had to collect the environmental uh, samples, uh, then we uh, had to inoculate them, reculture, uh, perform the uh, PCR, perform electrophoresis, uh, antibiotic resistance, um, statistical analysis. All of those steps were performed by me and my colleague Claudia Szarek. Uh, she's absent today because uh, she had to work in the uh, other work. She didn't get the free day. Thank you. Once again, thank you. If that's all, f uh, thank you very much. Give uh, the great applause. And uh, just uh, 
To była praca numer 15. Uh, and we get back to Miss Anna Dolipska, who, as far as I know, has no more issues with her connection. Can we check on that? Dzień dobry, czy się słyszymy? Tak, i się widzimy. Rewelacja, fantastycznie. Przepraszam bardzo um, za całą sytuację. Um, już udostępniam swoją prezentację. Czy Państwo to robią? Ja udostępniam swoją, tak? Tak, myślę, że będzie wygodniej nam i Pani, jeżeli Pani udostępni prezentację. Dobrze. Ok, widzimy, um, widzimy prezentację. Widzimy. Super. Um, bardzo się cieszę. Um, jeszcze raz dzień dobry, szanowni Państwo. Jeszcze raz bardzo przepraszam za sytuację. Natomiast um, niezwykle cieszę się, że udało mi się dziś z Państwem połączyć. Ja nazywam się Anna Dolipska i mam ogromną przyjemność zaprezentować pracę dotyczącą stężenia fetuiny A u pacjentów z przewlekłym wirusowym zapaleniem wątroby typu C. Gadał typu 1B podczas leczenia lekami przeciwwirusowymi o działaniu bezpośrednim. Słowem wstępu, glikoproteina wątrobowa, jaką jest fetuina A, jest związana z dysregulacją homeostazy metabolicznej. Natomiast samo zakażenie wirusem zapalenia wątroby typu C także wiąże się z zaburzeniami metabolizmu glukozy i lipidów. Jednak do dziś nie mamy takich jednoznacznych danych, które wskazywałyby nam, czy fetuina A może być zaangażowana w zaburzenia metaboliczne obserwowane właśnie w grupie pacjentów z przewlekłym wirusowym zapaleniem wątroby typu C. Dlatego też celem naszej pracy było oszacowanie poziomu fetuiny A u pacjentów z przewlekłym WZ2 typu C, do typu 1B, podczas leczenia lekami przeciwwirusowymi o działaniu bezpośrednim. Nasza grupa badana składała się z 85 pacjentów, było to 37 mężczyzn, a także 48 kobiet i byli to pacjenci ID Clinic w Mysłowicach. W dużym skrócie, po wywiadzie potwierdzającym utrzymywanie się HCV AB lub HCV RNA przez okres 6 miesięcy wraz z analizą zwłóknienia wątroby, które ocenialiśmy za pomocą fibroelastografii, zweryfikowano genotyp, a także wiremię HCV z czułością HCV RNA mniejszą bądź równą 15 jednostek w mililitrze. Dodatkowo wykonano USG wątroby, a także badania laboratoryjne, w tym badania białek powierzchniowych, a także przeciwciał całkowitych. Jeśli chodzi o kryteria wyłączenia, tutaj pacjenci z niewydolnością nerek, przeszczepem wątroby, a także z dekompensacją wątroby nie byli przez nas włączani do grupy badanej. Pacjentom zaproponowano terapię lekami bezpośrednio działającymi zgodnie z Narodowym Funduszem Zdrowia i biorąc pod uwagę choroby współistniejące, ale także przeciwwskazania i potencjalne interakcje lekowe, pacjenci zostali przez nas podzieleni na trzy grupy i byli leczeni jednym z trzech modeli, które widzicie Państwo w tym momencie na przezroczu. W naszej badanej grupie odsetek kobiet był co prawda wyższy niż odsetek mężczyzn, natomiast wiek obu grup był zbliżony. Stłuszczenie wątroby stwierdziliśmy u 19 pacjentów, natomiast u 17 były obecne przeciwciała całkowite HBC, co wskazuje na zakażenie wirusem utajonego zapalenia wątroby typu B. I co ważne, nie odnotowaliśmy żadnego przypadku reaktywacji HBV podczas leczenia DAA, a wszyscy nasi pacjenci objęci badaniem osiągnęli trwały clearance wirusa, niezależnie od modelu wybranego leczenia. Cały protokół badania został zatwierdzony przez Komisję Bioetyczną Śląskiego Uniwersytetu Medycznego w Katowicach, także był zgodny z wytycznymi etyki deklaracji helsińskiej. Każdy z pacjentów, który brał udział w projekcie po tym, jak był, po tym, jak został mu przedstawiony cel założenia badania, wyraził świadomą, pisaną zgodę na udział w takim badaniu. Niezgodnie ze standardowym schematem leczenia 
Podczas naszych wizyt kontrolnych tutaj przeprowadzono pomiary antropometryczne, takie jak wzrost masa ciała, obwód talii oraz bioder. Te wartości posłużyły nam do obliczenia wskaźnika BMI oraz WHR. Natomiast jeśli chodzi o badania laboratoryjne, były to rutynowe badania wykonywane w celu monitorowania leczenia. One obejmowały morfologię krwi obwodowej, aktywność aminotransferazy alaninowej, a także stężenie bilirubiny. I podczas pobierania krwi do tych rutynowych badań pobieraliśmy dodatkowo 2 ml krwi żelnej, aby zbadać stężenie fetuiny A. Tak, wszystkie takie pomiary dokonywane były na potrzeby projektu trzykrotnie. Pierwszy raz było to przed rozpoczęciem terapii, drugi raz po 12 tygodniach, czyli tak naprawdę pod koniec leczenia oraz trzeci raz po kolejnych 12 tygodniach w momencie oceny uzyskania trwałego klirensu wirusa. Jeśli chodzi o stężenie fetuiny A w surowicy, oznaczano je za pomocą zestawu Human Fetuin A Elisa Kit zgodnie z, protokoł, z protokołem producenta. Przeciwciała były specyficzne dla ludzkiego białka fetuiny A, natomiast czułość testu wynosiła 104 tysięczne nanograma na mililitr. Wszystkie wyniki przeanalizowaliśmy rutynowymi metodami statystycznymi. Wykorzystaliśmy w tym celu licencjonowane oprogramowanie statystika. I przechodząc do wyników, jakie uzyskaliśmy, tutaj zwiększona masa ciała, a także WHR podczas badania okazały się nie wykazywać istotności statystycznej niezależnie od płci. Dodatkowo nie stwierdziliśmy także istotnej statystycznie korelacji pomiędzy stężeniami fetuiny A, a BMI ani w grupie kobiet, ani w grupie mężczyzn. Jeśli chodzi o pomiary WHR, również nie wykazały one istotnej korelacji ze stężeniami fetuiny A u wszystkich uczestników badania. Natomiast w kwestii wartości stężeń fetuiny A w surowicy, one nie różniły się istotnie pomiędzy kolejnymi badaniami w całej badanej populacji i analizy wykonane również oddzielnie w grupie kobiet i w grupie mężczyzn także nie wykazały nam takiej istotności statystycznej. Dodatkowo te stężenia fetuiny A analizowaliśmy oddzielnie w podgrupach kobiet, a także mężczyzn, które dzieliliśmy dodatkowo na podgrupy ze względu na obecność bądź też brak obecności stłuszczenia wątroby. Przy takiej analizie również nie stwierdziliśmy różnic, które byłyby istotne statystycznie. W wyniku terapii Aktywność ALT była istotnie niższa pod koniec leczenia. Spodziewaliśmy się takich wyników. Natomiast w przypadku stężenia bilirubiny tutaj nie uzyskano wyników istotnych statystycznie. Dodatkowo stężenia fetuiny A oszacowane na początku, a także na końcu leczenia nie korelowały istotnie z aktywnością ALT we wszystkich badanych grupach i takie same wyniki tożsame uzyskano dla stężeń bilirubiny. I podsumowując, ze względu na to, że stężenia fetuiny A właśnie w grupie pacjentów z przewlekłym zapaleniem wątroby o genotypie 1B leczonych lekami przeciwwirusowymi o działaniu bezpośrednim według schematów były niższe niż wcześniej zgłaszane jako fizjologiczne, jednak nie zmieniły się istotnie w ciągu tych około 6 miesięcy, a także nie korelowały z parametrami antropometrycznymi oraz z wynikami rutynowych badań laboratoryjnych, jakie zostały przeprowadzone. Jej rola w tej właśnie grupie pacjentów powinna być oceniona tak naprawdę ponownie na podstawie zdecydowanie większych badań kohortowych, a także badań laboratoryjnych, które zbadałyby metabolizm glukozy, a także lipidów. Tyle od nas. Bardzo dziękuję za uwagę. Jeśli pojawiały się jakieś pytania, bardzo chętnie na nie odpowiem. Dziękuję. 
Dziękujemy. Oczywiście, brawa. Czy są jakieś pytania? Dobrze, w takim razie y, proszę ocenić wkład własny w wykonanie tej pracy. Mhm. A tutaj moją częścią e, w związku z tym, że jestem dietetykiem klinicznym, były e, pomiary antropometryczne, e, ale także m, analiza statystyczna, analiza danych, zebranie tych danych, e, przygotowanie dzisiejszego wystąpienia, przegląd literatury. Dobrze, dziękujemy. Rozumiem, że nie pojawiło się dziękuję. żadne dodatkowe pytanie, także ponownie nagrodzimy panią Annę Brawami. Bardzo dziękuję. I myślę, że możemy przejść do kolejnej pracy, bo rozumiem, że pani Patrycji Przebieradło z nami nadal nie ma. Nie. W takim razie zapraszam panią Agnieszkę Dulską, która jest, jest mężczyzną. Pan Jakub Bodziony w takim razie zapraszam na scenę. Drogi autor, rozumiem, nie ma absolutnie problemu i oddaję e, tutaj scenę. So esteemed committee and dear colleagues, uh, my name is Jakub Bodziony. And I'm a member of a scientific club of a chair in the Department of Gynecology, Obstetrics and Oncological, Oncological Gynecology of Medical University of Silesia. So thus vulvar li uh, lichen sclerosis predispose young girls and adolescents to autoimmune thyroid diseases. Vulvar lichen sclerosis is a chronic inflammatory disease of unclear etiology. VLS can occur at any age or in any sex, although the highest values can be observed in women let's say middle-aged, and in prepubertal girls. There is a oh, the clear, clear peak of incidence um, in girls aged 4 to 6, which represents up to 15% of all varvar lichen sclerosis cases. It is estimated that VLS can be uh, observed in 1 in 900 of premenarchal girls. So the etiopathogenesis, as I mentioned before, uh, remains unknown and it's probably multifactorial. Uh, there are multiple theories, but the most popular are autoimmune and genetical <coughs> conditioning. Although theories concerning hormonal and infectious etiology <coughs> have also been raised. So, the first symptoms are usually very non-specific and misdiagnosed by general practitioners and pediatricians. So, VLS manifests in lesions, in peri perineal pain, vaginal bleeding, dysuria, uh, but also in itching sensation or in constipation. Um, those symptoms in sexually active girls can also be missed as, la as uh, signs of infectious, uh, of infectious disease of the urogenital tract. So in physical examination, uh, we can detect clearly demarcated skin, uh, lesions with the characteristic uh, figure eight or hourglass shape, uh, the skin on labia, clitoris and on in, in the anal area is atrophic, smooth and shiny. We can also observe uh, lesions, erosions, scars, adhesions and bruises. Um, those signs may be often uh, incorrectly recognized as a sign of sexual harassment, but we have to remember that those cases do not exclude each other. So the prevalence of VLS is another gauge girls is understated due to misreading the symptoms of the with the pediatricians and GPs as I mentioned before and so the other part of that is delayed access to specialists lack of sexual education and the fear of parents to check the genital area of their children this is why we aimed this study uh, we decided to investigate the area of possible coexistence of autoimmune thyroid diseases in girls with VLS. So, I'd like to present the material and methods. Our study sample um, was found in Gynecological Clinic of Centrum Zdrowia Kobiety in, Zab uh, in Katowice. And we divided the patients into the two groups. The study group consisted of 12, uh, 20 girls with previously diagnosed VLS. 
and the control consisted of 35 girls. They were aged 12 to, uh, I mean, 2 to 18 years old. The control group was, were the patients of the, of the clinic because of other um, gynecological issues like infections. Uh, the exclusion criteria was the autoimmune diseases, pharmacotherapy, systemic diseases, addiction, pregnancy, or lack of consent, of course. The study, uh, the study achieved all the necessary approvals of bioethics committee. Well, it was our founding and the, the approvals, and we performed also the anamnesis. Then we moved on uh, to the collection of the, of the blood samples. So uh, after the collection, we assessed the anti-TPO antibodies in, and anti-TG antibodies, as mentioned here uh, uh, on the presentation. And we performed the statistical analysis according to the presentation. Now I'd like to present the results. So first, we assessed antibodies against thyroid peroxidase. In the study group, only one patient with VLS presented the uh, TPO antibodies, while in control group, three of them had those antibodies. On the other hand, uh, with thyroid globulin, in the study group, also only one patient presented uh, antibodies, while in control group, six of them had those antibodies. For both groups, the results were statistically insignificant. Then we checked the family history of ATD uh, in all the patients. So in the group with a positive family history of thyroid autoimmune diseases, T TG antibodies were found in two patients, and TPO antibodies were found in four patients. And in the group with a negative family, family history, uh, the TG antibodies were found in five people, and none of them had TPO antibodies. We compared the people from positive and negative family history if it comes to antibodies, and for both groups, the results were statistically insignificant. Um, the antibodies and the onset of symptoms is another interesting case. As I mentioned before, we had patients with, with those conditions. It was the aim, in fact. Uh, so in the study group, only one patient had those TPO antibodies. Her onset of VLS symptoms was at six years old, followed by a rapid diagnosis. And the mean onset age uh, is seven years, while the mean age of diagnosis is eight years and three months. In the study group, also, we had one patient only with TG antibodies, as I mentioned before, and her onset was at nine years old, uh, followed by the rapid diagnosis, and the patient, no, I'm sorry, uh, the nine years old, while the onset age is seven years, and the patient was diagnosed with VLS at 10 years old, at 10 months, while the mean age is eight years old. Unfortunately, the, the results were also statistically insignificant. So in conclusion, no statistically significant relation between the occurrence of VLS and levels of TPO and TG antibodies were found. No patient presented symptoms of thyroid diseases and none of them was diagnosed with them in the neonatal periods. Mean age of ATD diagnosis is estimated as almost 12 years, while VLS is like eight years. Most of the, our patients may have not presented the ATD antibodies so far. So nevertheless, it is necessary to provide a patient with multidisciplinary medical care. The issue requires follow-up, of course, and further research on larger group of patients. Thank you for your attention. And now I'm waiting for your questions, which I hope I can answer. Yeah, thank you for your uh, presentation, for your work. And uh, do we have any, any questions? Oh, we do. I will give you a microphone since we are uh, live. Dziękuję bardzo. Kendokrynolog, chciałam zapytać, czy państwo mierzyliście też gospodarkę hormonalną, TSH i wolne hormony tarczycy? We haven't assessed the, the, thyroid, uh, the thyroid system because of all of the girls were meant to be healthy at the start. So they, um, we had, um, they, at the neonatal period, they, they had all the necessary tests, and later on, they didn't present any symptoms of the thyroid diseases. Okay, thank you. 
Thank you. Any other questions? And what was your input then uh, in this uh, piece of scientific work? Uh, we recruited all the pa uh, me and my colleagues recruited all the patients. Uh, we we collected the samples, then we prepared the samples. Uh, we performed the statistical analysis. We had the idea, of course, for this. We also made a case review. Uh, uh, I mean, the literature review for that. We found the literature. And the only, the only part which wasn't made by us, in fact, is the, the lab itself, which was performed by the professional lab in Wrocław. Okay, thank you. And uh, to the last work, I believe, uh, of today's sessions, we are the only ones still running. Uh, all the other have ended already. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and the last speaker, uh, Wojciech Kazura. Give a great applause for Jakub Living and Wojciech Kazura entering the stage. Szanowni Państwo, nazywam się Wojciech Kazura, jestem doktorantem na Katedrze Fizjologii Wydziału Nauk Medycznych w Zabrzu. Mam przyjemność zaprezentować Państwu wyniki moich badań, a więc efekt operacji bariatrycznej oraz różnych modeli żywieniowych na stężenia czy aktywności wybranych parametrów stresu oksydacyjnego u szczurów z otyłością i dokowaną dietą. Jak zapewne Państwo się ze mną zgodzą, otyłość obecnie jest ogromnym problemem, wciąż narastającym. Według danych WHO w 2016 roku blisko co czwarty mieszkaniec Europy zmagał się z problemem otyłości. Myślę, że obecnie procent ten jest jeszcze większy. Jak Państwo oczywiście wiecie, otyłość wiąże się z wieloma problemami, począwszy od obniżenia jakości życia po nowotwory czy choroby sercowo-naczyniowe. Jest wiele rodzajów leczenia, natomiast za najskuteczniejsze uważa się operacje bariatryczne, e, szczególnie skuteczne w przypadku otyłości e, olbrzymiej. Natomiast jest to działka bardzo szeroko obecnie się rozwijająca, natomiast niewiele wiadomo na temat mechanizmów e, komórkowych czy wpływu tych operacji, poza oczywiście e, zmniejszeniem masy ciała na, na metabolizm, na zmiany metabolizmu, na procesy na podłożu komórkowym. Ja w moich badaniach skupiłem się na operacji zespolenia dwunastniczotrzego. Jest to operacja restrykcyjna, która, która polega na wytworzeniu pętli i w tym przypadku wyłączeniu przedniego odcinka jelita z następowym umożliwieniem aktywacji dalszych odcinków. Jako, że otyłość jest uogólnionym procesem zapalnym, celem mojego badania było, była ocena właśnie tej operacji oraz różnych modeli żywieniowych na wybrane parametry stresu oksytacyjnego u szczurów z otyłością i dokowaną dietą. Grupę badaną stanowiło 48 szczurów szczepu Spragdale. Jest to uniwersalny model stosowany w tego rodzaju badaniach. Na początku szczury miały 7 tygodni, wszystkie były płci męskiej. Po tygodniu oklimatyzacji w naszej katedrze podzieliliśmy je losowo na dwie grupy. Połowa otrzymywała dietę kafeteria, która składa się w 45% z tłuszczu, 35% z węglowodanów, a więc jest to taka dieta zachodnia, trochę fast foodowa. Dieta kontrolna była to standardowa dieta przeznaczona dla szczurów. Taką dietę stosowaliśmy 8 tygodni, następnie szczury znowu zostały poddane losowo do dwóch grup, operacji DIOS, czyli operacji zespolenia dwunastniczotczego oraz operacji SHAM, która jest operacją pozorowaną. Po operacji ponownie trafiły do, do różnych grup żywieniowych, także na koniec eksperymentu osiągnęliśmy 8 grup badawczych po 6 szczurów w każdej grupie. Jeśli chodzi o metodologię, to szczury oczywiście były... W trakcie, w trakcie wykonywania procedur operacyjnych odpowiednio znieczulone, dostawały leki przeciwbólowe, ksylazyny, katamina, były znieczulone izofluranem. 
Następnym etapem operacji była, było przygotowanie, wygolenie sierści, przygotowanie pola operacyjnego, dezynfekcja, otwarcie jamy brzusznej cięciem pośrodkowym z wyłonieniem jelit i początkowe, początkowego odcinka dwunastnicy i przeprowadzono operację DIOS, która polega na zespoleniu dwunastniczy z jelitem cienkim w mniej więcej jednej trzeciej z zamkniętym, zamknięciem proksymalnego odcinka na ślepo. Druga część szczurów była poddana operacji SHAM, czyli operacji pozorowanej. Cięcia były wykonane w tym samym miejscu, natomiast zespolenia były wykonane tak w sposób fizjologiczny, tak żeby wykluczyć wpływ operacji per se na otrzymane wyniki. Następnie w, y, rany pooperacyjne były zamknięte warstwowo i tak jak wcześniej przedstawiałem na slajdach, szczury na 8 tygodni ponownie wróciły na odpowiednie diety, potem zostały poddane eutanazji, poborowi tkanek i przygotowanie do dalszych analiz. Otrzymaliśmy następujące wyniki. Ocenialiśmy parametry stresu oksytacyjnego w homogenatach wątroby. I jak Państwo widzicie, na niebiesko przedstawione są wyniki u szczurów po operacji zespolenia dwunastniczotczego, na czerwono po operacji pozorowanej. We wszystkich tych grupach w przypadku reduktazy glutationowej aktywność reduktazy glutationowej była niższa po operacji DIOS. Również w przypadku grupy CDCD, czyli przed i po operacji na diecie kontrolnej, te parametry były najniższe. Ponownie, podobnie wyniki wyglądały dla katalazy, również operacja DIOS w większości przypadków powodowała redukcję aktywności parametrów stresu oksydacyjnego. Glutation, peroksydeza glutationowa, tutaj też możemy zaobserwować, że w miarę stosowania diety tej takiej wysokotłuszczowej, wysokocukrowej parametry stresu oksydacyjnego narastały. Tutaj znowu operacja DIOS miała pozytywny efekt. Podobne wyniki obserwowaliśmy dla transferazy glutationowej i dla dysmutazy ponadtlenkowej. Tutaj też najniższe aktywności są przy tych dietach, które, które są dietami zdrowymi. W przypadku wdrożenia diety, powiedzmy tej fast foodowej, te parametry stresu oksytacyjnego istotnie narastały. I wyniki dla aldehydu malonowego, który jest wskaźnikiem peroksydacji lipidów, Tutaj też, mimo że te istotności statystyczne są mniejsze, możemy zauważyć, że operacja DIOS wpływała na zmniejszenie stężenia aldehydu malonowego i również dieta miała tutaj bardzo, bardzo ważne implikacje kliniczne. Podsumowując, dieta, operacja DIOS, czyli operacja zespolenia dwunastniczotczego, która jest operacją metaboliczną, a nie stricte bariatryczną, czyli wpływa na, na metabolizm, była tutaj skuteczna, natomiast... Ważny jest fakt diety i wydaje się, że dieta jest ważniejsza niż sama operacja. To znaczy stosowanie diety wysokotłuszczowo, wysokocukrowej jest, powoduje wzrost tych parametrów mimo operacji. Dziękuję za uwagę. E, dziękuję. Czy mamy jakieś pytania? W takim razie yy, proszę ocenić wkład własny w tą pracę, czy Pan Jasne, operował rozumiem. te biedne szczurki? Yy, ta praca, którą przedstawiłem Państwu jest, jest częścią dużego projektu, którym zajmujemy się już od lat. W czasie, kiedy te szczury były operowane, bo bazujemy na tkankach od nich pozyskanych, yy, wówczas ja osobiście nie miałem prawnej możliwości operowania tych szczurów, byłem tylko osobą uczestniczącą w wykonywaniu procedur, a nie osobą wykonującą z racji różnych... Yy, dyrektyw unijnych, w związku z czym y, osobiście ich nie operowałem, natomiast od samego początku biorę udział w projekcie, zajmowałem się y, przygotowaniem do operacji, zajmowaniem się tym szczurów, y, szczurami, pomiarami antropometrycznymi, y, następnie y, pobieraniem tkanek, przygotowaniem homogenatów, analizą wyników. Dziękuję bardzo. Dziękuję. Nie pojawiły się żadne pytania. Dobrze. E, pozwolę sobie zakończyć w języku polskim, naszym ojczystym, e, bo jak tutaj już zostało takie otwarcie e, przez Pana zrobione, oczywiście brawa. Rozumiem, że nie pojawił się ostatni zaginiony uczestnik, e, czyli Pani, e, pani 
która mi już uciekła, ale rozumiem, że y, zakończamy tą sesję. Jesteśmy, tak jak wspomniałem, ostatnią trwającą obecnie sesją, więc też przy okazji zakończamy pierwszy dzień trwania e, trwania obrad w największej konferencji naukowej na Śląsku i w Polsce. Dziękuję wszystkim uczestnikom za cudowne prace. Jurorom proszę nie uciec z kartami oceny, są nam jeszcze potrzebne. Zakończenie wiem, że zostanie minimalnie najprawdopodobniej przesunięte. Tutaj patrzę, czy Piotr kiwnie głową, że tak. Będziemy w kontakcie z Państwami, na pewno będzie też informacja na stronie. Także dziękuję Wam jeszcze raz, nagrodźmy się brawami, bo zasłużyliście, zasłużyliście na nie. To tyle, dziękuję.